deck the halls, trim the trees, drink your eggnog, whatever it takes to get you through 2020, people. This is the season finale of Blabberbrain Show, and we're going out big with rock legends John Elefante and Lacey and Josh Sturm. You're not going to want to miss this show. Let's do this. <laughs> And welcome to the Christmas holiday Blabberbrain show special. <laughs> I know we've been gone for, uh, geez, what, since Thanksgiving, I think was uh, our last uh, time out here. So we've been gone for, for almost a month. But And the people loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I... People ask me for more. Who, who, who are your fans? <laughs> oh, there's a, I have no fans. That's why they, they're they happy. They're like, you're not going to do anything with, uh, you know, with, with it, doing another podcast. I says, I don't know when that's going to be. Well, take your time. Yeah, right? as long oh, as you man. Can, you, need some, you need some new fans. Anyways, uh, Michael Cadre over here, uh, Big M over there. Uh, we welcome you to the Black Brain Show. And um, yes, this is, as you can tell by our attire by the lights christmas tree the red everywhere it's hanukkah so uh well it's hanukkah but it's also christmas this is uh that's why we're, we're this is the christmas holiday show we're going to include everything in there um even kwanzaa you know what the heck it's a made up holiday but who cares we're gonna we're gonna include kwanzaa in there and the serbians are i think the second week of january <clears throat> so we yeah welcome in yeah, we'll, we probably won't have another episode up by then. But okay, welcome. <laughs> uh, the what? What is that? The um, Orthodox, right? The Orthodox uh, Christmas. I'm not really sure. I live. I mean, a couple miles from me is Wall, Pennsylvania, and there's still a lot of mm. old Serbians and people I went to school with that live there. Pretty much all of them were that were Serbian. You know, yeah, my so. my daughter has a Serbian friend, but I, uh, it's, it's a uh, Greek Orthodox. Uh, Christmas is in January. Uh, so we'll wrap that in there too. Isn't Ramadan here too? We'll wrap the Ramadan that in I don't this. Know. But I, I don't, I'm sorry. We're going to include every holiday. Uh, we just happen to, I guess, personally uh, celebrate Christmas. So that's why we're like this. Although we all know it's about that man up there, only not like that, like in a manger, little baby. But uh, Santa Claus, what the heck? We're going to, we're going to uh, do it with Santa Claus. So. Um, and so, you know, I, uh, I was thinking about this for, for the show, you know, when you think about Christmas, you know, it's, it's a little bit different for me cause I have kids and, uh, although they're older now, um, I got to relive what it was like, um, when I was a kid, like through them and their excitement of Christmas and everything. And, um, it gets you thinking about like the, the memories of Christmas Good and bad. You know, Christmas, there, there's, I mean, good things and bad things. My father-in-law passed away a week before Christmas. Uh, I remember you know, that. Uh, some time ago, 13 years ago now, I think. And, um, but I think back when I was a kid about, about Christmas. Now, we had a weird um, tradition when I was a kid. I'm not sure. And, and I, I thought that we were the only ones who did this. Actually, when I was a kid, you think that everybody did, does it, right? But as you grow up, you realize, geez, nobody else is doing this. And then later on, I found out, oh, we did that too. Uh, in our household, we had, um, our Christmas tree was sitting up in our living room, but it wasn't decorated until Christmas morning. Uh, because our tradition was that Santa Claus would come and help decorate the tree. I'm like, when the hell does he have time to do all that? You know, he's, <laughs> yeah, he's going to go to every single house and deliver gifts and he's got time to decorate the tree. <laughs> Somehow when you're a kid, you just, you know, you you suspend your, your belief of, of reality and you, you believe in that sort of st things. But have you ever heard of that? Have you ever heard of like Santa Claus helping to decorate the Christmas tree? Is that, or is that just our family? No, I think, I mean, we never did that. It was a big deal for us in early December, you know, as a kid or even, you know, I was with somebody for a long time and I started going out when I started going out with her and her son was, I think, eight at the time. So, you know, kind of went through the whole thing of the, few, you know, with the Santa Claus and, and everything like that. And no, it was usually the week after that weekend of, um, of, th of Thanksgiving usually. But if I remember the tradition many years ago, people used to actually, with the kids, they didn't even bring a tree in until Christmas morning. And it was all decorated and the tree was there. And the, yeah. yeah, but that was, I think that was traditional a very long time ago though. 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I like I said, when you're a kid, you don't question these things. You just figure that that's the way everybody's. I never asked my friends, "Hey, well, what is it? What's it like at your place on Christmas?" I don't know. Maybe other kids question it. I didn't. I just took it on face value, whatever. But um, I think the the hardest thing for me was um, the balance between lying to my kids about Santa Claus <laughs> and like, cause I wanted to tell them the truth and just like, let them still want to believe I, you know, my, my old business partner, that's what he did with his kids. He like, they told him the truth at, at kids and they're like, we don't care. We still want to believe and let them, let them choose. But then there's that part of me that like, you, I remember when I was their age and that was like magical. It was, you know, the, like going to see the, the, the Santa in the mall, you knew they were all different and the whole thing of, Oh, that's just Santa's helper and blah, blah, blah. And, but as some, somehow as a kid, you don't even question it. You just believe it. And I, I remember I wasn't crushed. Like when I found out, I was like, oh yeah, I kind of figured that out. You know, but by the time you figure it out, you're like, I figured it out. And I wasn't pissed at my parents. So, I'm, so I struggle with that. I'm like, I always try never to lie to my kids. Right. And I, I just don't want to lie to them. And I was like, I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is eventually somehow going to come back to me some where along the lines where I say, look, girls, I never lie to you. Well, what about Santa Claus? Uh, you That's know what I mean? It's different though. I, it is different. I, and I think you get, a, you get a pass for that as a parent because, you know, again, there's just something magical about that. You know, now our, our focus is on other things, but we still, you know, the whole, it, it's weird because like as a family, you have this, this blend, this uh, cross of, uh, of secular and Christian uh, celebration of, of Christmas. And, um, you know, my heart wants to focus on the birth of Christ, but the celebration of the season is just all about everything that comes along with, with Christmas, the Christmas tree, the presents, the decorations, all that other stuff that has nothing to do with that. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I still, I still love Christmas. I, I, as the older I get, the uh, the more cranky I get about the weather. And it's, we got a, a, a white Christmas right now. It's, it's snowing like crazy uh, outside here in the Berg. And uh, I think just today, I think we got more snow today than we got the last two seasons combined because we had a couple of mild winters the last few years. We got a lot here. Mm -hmm. I'd say there's definitely over a half a foot setting out. Oh yeah. We got yard. easily, easily, that. easily seven or eight inches uh, here. So but anyways, um, anyway, let, let's get to, uh, there's a couple things I, I want to boast about. I don't know if you have anything to boast about, but no, let's, uh, let's do a blabber boast. Let's cue it. Blabber boast. All right. Well, I don't want to let you go first this time. I'll, I'll be a gentleman and, and give you first honors. On, <laughs> on, I actually, I get, I actually have two things I want to boast about real quick. So, but go ahead. Well, anyhow, I'm actually nipping on this right now. So uh -huh. God knows what's going to happen. This is um, <laughs> Uncle Nearest, 1884. It is a small batch Tennessee whiskey. And I bought the ball. No, I didn't go through this today. I mean, I've had this for a couple of weeks. And um, it's it's really good. I mean, I saw a commercial wow. for it. They were advertising. And there was three different. They had three different um, ones that you could select from. And I decided this one was on sale. So I decided. to Uncle Ben's? Uncle Nearest. Oh, we're no, we're not talking rice. about we're not talking about rice here. This is this isn't made with rice. This isn't a sake or anything. <laughs> it probably goes for some sake. But it's um, um it's it's ninety three proof. It's really smooth, and they and say what, it's, what's the retail on that? Uh, it was like in the mid forties, I think. Okay. Here, I think it was on sale, and I think I paid forty five for it. It might have been fifty or fifty one. 52 something like that here well it looks like you put a hurting on that bottle already well so. it's been in two over two weeks i've nipped at it and i uh figured for this i when i was at christmas shopping for others i mean i after, after tomorrow i work one more day in the next 17 days and i got these steeler um rocks glasses which were pretty cool yeah, you have and, to flash. You have to flash that when we have our our uh, guest John Elefante on because oh, yeah. we we uh, John and I always banter back and forth about Steelers and Titans and stuff. And just like so that, that so. you know, I this oh. is what I have for this is for you. Oh, well, I know I'm, you. I'm coming over because I got this for you. Oh man! And because when I know you won't take any money off me when we go into the I go into the <laughs> studio in early January to do this short little acoustic th single. 
and I figured I bought, I'd bring you a bottle of this. I thought we might do it before Christmas, and then in case you got too crazy with the family and everything, and you wanted a couple <laughs> of drinks, you could have, you could have had it. <laughs> I might have, might have to make a special trip over to your house. So or that, or I could drop, I could drop it <laughs> off to you. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, that's that's very kind. I mean, that's awesome. Uh, you know, that's my. That's my uh, drink of choice, as you know. I mean, every time that uh, you do your uh, Mark Anthony solo and friends shots, that's what I'm I'm laying down. At. And um, you know, I, I it's not that I don't try other whiskey. I I I do. I I've tried plenty. It's just I go back to that double mellow gentleman Jack, and it's just it's just it it's just really good. good. Yeah. I mean, I'm more of a I'm more of a um, yeah Jim Beam. You like the Jim, Jim Beam? Oh, I like Jim Beam black. Black, yeah. You know, cause I. The regular Jim Beam. I mean, I'll drink it if it's if it's only. Well, it's the same with regular Jack. I'm not a huge regular Jack. I mean, I'm, I I I'll, I'll drink regular Jack and it's good, but I, that's not what I usually buy. But oh, there's such a difference between regular Jack Daniels and oh, big time. Stack Jack. And although I, I I still think that I ought to get that GoFundMe going for the the uh, the select the Sinatra select. <laughs> it's like it's like three hundred ninety dollars for a bottle. But, uh, you know, you know, I, I just, I'm a big Frank Sinatra fan, I'm a big Jack Daniels fan. That's got to be good, man. That's got to be I wonder what makes it, I didn't read anything about it. I know it's out there, but I mean, I'm, what is it, age for 35 years? Or is I have it no aged idea. in one of his shoes? Or, but I, <laughs> but I, I, I would still drink it if it was dip, aged in one of his shoes. Dip a jacket in it? Or <laughs> <laughs> if that was in one of his shoes, I probably would still drink it. Uh, but anyways, no, I, I don't know. I don't know what's, uh, I mean, different about it. It's just, uh, you know. It was made specifically for, um, I think it was, it's based on, um, you know, his love of Jack Daniels and, um, what's different about it. I don't know. I know, I know one part, two people actually that have actually bought a bottle of it and they say it's phenomenal. So I, I actually would love to have, a, I would hope for it that bottle. price that it would and be fantastic. If I have any uh, wealthy friends out there who are looking to get me something for Christmas, you know, there you go. The, the Sinatra <laughs> select, but, uh, no, the two things I want to blab about, um, right now um first of all our um for king and country their new christmas album which for king and country is just it they're a very odd band because they're a really good band and a lot of people have heard about them but a lot of people have never heard of it they're they're like with the most popular band that like a lot of people have never heard of you know <laughs> they uh they they pack a crowd their their shows are ev every bit as uh, extravagant and big production as like U2 or anything like that when you go see them on tour and it's a big pr production their songs are great um and there's so many people that love them and go to their shows and they've been having this drive-in uh concert series and they've been selling out like every drive-in theater that they go to go to play and uh but then you still ask so many people and they're like yeah i've never heard of them um but they give a nod to pittsburgher gabby barrett uh, from uh, American Idol and our buddy Steve O'Toole. What's up, Steve? Uh, I know follows the show. Uh, played guitar for, for Gabby uh, when they uh, American Idol did a um, uh, an expose on Gabby. She was like one of the final three contestants on American Idol. And she'd had a big concert downtown. And uh, Steve was playing guitar for her and everything like that. Well, anyway, she uh, sings. Uh, she has a guest uh, spot on the song, on, uh, on the album. Um, and... They just did a live uh, performance of the album uh, on Monday, uh, broadcast on YouTube and Facebook, and they played the, just about every song from the album live. Uh, really cool because they were in California and they they had like they were in the mountains of California. You could see like the sun was setting and it was just a beautiful backdrop and everything like that. But then they uh, had Gabby Barrett call in on, on Facetime and uh, and sing "O Come Emmanuel" uh, with them, and that was really cool. But anyways. The the song the the album is filled with uh, traditional uh, Christmas classics as well as a few of their original songs, but it has that for King and Country twist that they put on there. But I recommend that to anybody looking for some new Christmas music coming up. And as far as the the, the spirits coming up, um, I want to boast about this right here, this uh, Renwood. And I actually can't remember if I talked about this or not on the show. If I talked about this before, I, for, I, I forget. I don't know. You might have talked to me about it before. I'm f I've, I've I'm, heard you talk about it before. I'm gonna, Nothing was here. I know I did on, on social media, but I'm going to blab about this again. Um, this is some freaking good wine, man. This is Old Vine Zinfandel, uh, Renwood. And um, it's been on Chairman Select. And I'm over the last two months, 
I don't know. I must have bought six or eight bottles of it. I'm gonna just, have to I, buy I, a bottle of it then. Well, I'm just, I just keep going back to it because it's that good. I'm just like, anytime I go back into the uh, wine and spirit store, if they have it there, I'm buying it because uh, it's a great deal. I think it's uh, normally like $40. They had it on sale for like $12.99 or something like that. Chairman Select. Uh, anyways, if you see this bottle, this old vines in Renwood uh, in your local uh, wine and spirits place, or in your, if you're, if you go to, if you're in a place where the, the they sell uh, wine in your grocery store and they have this, get this wine. I tell you, you will not be disappointed at all. Oh. So that ends this edition of. Level Boost. All right. <clears throat> There's um. We're trying to keep this segment a little bit short because we got an extended show here uh, coming up. And uh, we got two guests, as I uh, mentioned in the beginning, uh, coming up. We got John Elefante coming up and Lacey Sturm and her husband, Josh, coming up a little bit later. But um, I just want to talk about, you know, I want to combine Christmas and uh, current events in some way, shape or form, try to bring them together. And I think it's one of the, the, the I guess, depending on which side you're sitting on with uh, the, the topic of this, it could be a great Christmas gift. It could be not a good Christmas gift. But the, the, um, the thing that they said wasn't going to be here by Christmas is the vaccine. And it looks like it is coming up for COVID. I think for a lot of people, I think this is good news. A lot of people that are going to be scared to take it. I understand that, whatever, but I'm waiting, baby. Yeah. I'm ready. I, I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I think, I think it's a good Christmas gift for, for America and for the world that there's at least uh, a few of them rolling out already. And, um, you know, myself, I, I never get the flu shot. I probably won't get the, this, not because of the fact I'm afraid of it or anything like that, but just because of the fact that I just, I'm not sick very often. Um, I don't know. I, it, my, my mind might change uh, later on during, during this whole thing. But um, anyways, I, I, I'm not going to sit there and say, don't get this flu shot because X, Y, Z. I'm going to say, I think this is a good thing. I think this is a good thing that the vaccine is here. And I think it's, a, it's something that we can celebrate as, as, a, um, uh, as a Christmas gift to America. And um, so, you know, th because this is still scary times. I know plenty of people being affected by COVID right now. And which is really weird because we've only had like, I say only like something like 15 million uh, people in, in the United States affected with COVID. And which is like 4% of our population where H1N1 is like 60 million people, which is like 17% of our population. I didn't know anybody that had the H1N1. I, 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 don't I knew, think I did either. I, I know, I knew nobody, <laughs> but yet, I, I've known at least, I don't know, 10 people that, that, that had COVID and stuff already. So it's kind of odd where I used to think that everybody was going to eventually get this. And now I don't think that way anymore. I don't think that we're all going to get this because we're at 15 million now with the vaccine. I don't think we're going to reach 60 million because of the vaccine. No, I, um, hope, I hope not anyhow. And thankfully, this isn't as dead. The, the H1N1 wasn't as deadly as, as uh, COVID because otherwise we would have had a lot yeah, more. Yeah, I, I know two. I know two people who have lost family members, a, a mother-in-law and, and then an uncle. And he actually has another family member who's in the hospital right now, too, that's not, that's not doing so well. So Yeah, so we, we needed a win. We, and I think the vaccine is a good win for America. Um, what, what the, I guess time is yet to tell because, you know, it just kind of makes you a little sad uh, because of everybody getting sick and, and some people dying and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, there's, you know, I, I think of, you know, the, you know, get the, the Christmas blues as, uh, you know, Elvis Presley said, I'll have a blue Christmas without you and stuff like that. But uh, anyway, so I think we need a pick me up. Um, and I want to know, uh, Big M, you got all those guitars around you. Would you be willing to in, in, indulge us with a little Christmas magic of your own? Oh, God, I'm I've changed gears here, baby. We're really oh. going to cheapen it up. Oh, you got the cars. Uh, you got the car. I, I used to thought that was your Roy Roger guitar, but you corrected me saying that was your your Disney Pixar uh, cars. Yeah, it doesn't uh, say in tune guitar. or anything, but it's sort of a guitar. But it's very festive. And I've changed the. I put together words just here while I was sipping on this a little earlier. I was waiting for a <laughs> guitar to come in to come to me by UPS, uh, a thin line Telecaster, and because of the weather here. In Western Pennsylvania, it's been delayed until tomorrow. They didn't tell me that until seven o'clock. 
So. Well, well, why don't you serenade everybody with a little bit of Christmas well, magic? How about a little bit of Santa blues here? And um, I don't know if I could play it on this or not. And if I'm going to remember the words on it, this is jotted down. I got a couple <laughs> notes over here. So. I guess I got to get a bluesy voice. Well, it's getting close to Christmas. Don't know what I'm going to do. Well, it's getting close to Christmas. Don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I'm spreading the news. I got the Santa blue. Yeah. Well, I'm running low on toilet paper. I'm running low on soap. If Santa needs to wash his hands, I don't care if he's the Pope. I got the blues. I got the Santa blues. Rudolph spread the news. I got the Santa blues. Well, I'm low on hand sanitizer. Please see six feet away. When I want to get close to a woman, she pulls out the mace. I got the blues. <laughs> I got the Santa um. blues. Rude, I'll spread the news. I got the Santa blues. I got the Santa blues. Oh, yeah. yeah. The big My M, chestnuts ladies and gentlemen. are roasting on an open fire. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the big M, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with John Elefante. I and screwed later that up on, a little bit, but oh well. <laughs> it's okay. Later on, we have uh, Lacey Sturm and her husband, Josh. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a minute. Black Brains. Welcome back to the Blabberbrain Show. And if uh, that song that you heard right there in the break is called We Will Be Fine. And if the voice sounds familiar to you, it should because it's a legendary voice of John Elefante, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming on the show, John. Let's cue the big applause. There you go. Glad to be here, Michael. John, uh, I'm friends and I'm proud, proud to be with you. Yeah, well, John, as everybody knows, uh, legendary uh, singer, songwriter, producer, multi Grammy awards, Dove awards. Uh, how many Grammy awards you win? Four. Nominated for a bunch more. I mean, do I, I don't want to. I don't want to cut you short. Is it? How many Grammy awards have you won? I stopped counting. Okay, <laughs> you've won multiple Grammy awards, multiple Dove awards, and uh, no, I'm just. I'm that was pompous. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. I mean, obviously, by, by your accomplishments on the wall there, um, you know, I think that besides all of the uh, the those kind of accolades, I think everybody knows uh, who you are and what you've done, both with Kansas and both um, uh, on a, your solo career, and as well as I don't know if how many people know. Uh, the bands that you've produced or, or your projects that you've been involved with, but uh, you know, you anybody just go out there and look you up on the internet and see that you're 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 a busy guy in the music industry, and uh, even your your uh, I mean your former recording studio was in Nashville was a, a pretty busy studio as well. You've had a lot of artists come in there as well, um, but you know you and I've known each other for I don't know 
like seven years or something like that. Whenever, when, when did uh, On My Way to the Sun come out? Was it like 2013 or something like that? Uh, I think you, Michael, you know, I think you and I have known each other longer than that. 10 well, we go back to like actually to 99. I, I first met you in 1999, but we weren't friends back then. So that goes back, you know, 20, 21 years now. But On uh, My Way to the Sun came out, I think, I want to say about seven or eight years ago. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it seems just like a, yesterday, it seems like I just put that record out. Well, you know, the older you get, the the shorter time is. I mean, uh-huh. I could do five years standing on one leg for crying out loud. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, I mean, it was a great album. It was a great, uh, you know, solo effort. Uh, you know, all your solo stuff, you know, I mean, forget about what you've done with Kansas. Kansas has its own like little niche, like cut out. Uh, your, your solo stuff is obviously it, it's recognizable because of your voice, but the writing is, is what's, what's key there. And I think there, that there's some, uh, symmetry to Kansas because you were, you know, wrote a, a lot of those you know, songs. I, and you I, sang I've, all. I've always written, I've always written like that. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, but also, uh, you and Dino, your brother have a very special relationship and I know you guys yeah. write a lot of stuff together. Um, do you think that your like relationship with your brother is key to like your sound and, and your, your music or is it, just, is it, or is he riding on your coattails or what's going on? No, he's not. No, no. Dino's, um, I would say his role is being my best critic. Okay. John, take, take the song this way. It's, it's, it, you, I don't like where this is going. Uh, let's work on this lyric together let's um let's write a new bridge you know stuff like that right yeah i think it's a it's a, a it's really very integral you know to a to a, a great song yeah I mean, it's it, very important it, it's a dynamic uh relationship you have uh with your brother so and obviously the it's, love and hate <laughs> <laughs> well it's siblings what do you want you know what i mean so um i mean it's it's there's there's love hate never kind of it's been working for a long time <laughs> yeah so you know why why fool with it yeah it, it has it has so uh you know as we uh we got cued into the the beginning here we we uh we heard a, a song called we will be fine which is a brand new song you're we're premiere we're, i don't know i know some other people have heard the song but i'm gonna like just say right now that it was a blabber brain show premiere we premiered it here You've heard it, uh, probably not first, but you know, for this listening audience, that's the first time you've heard the song. So it was a Blabber Brains premiere song. So obviously you're working on some new material. Um, and I, I, I should have a new record out by, well, it's going to be done early, early 2021, but it's probably not going to be released until April of 2021 because we want to do a simultaneous release with Europe. Right. Well, as we to deal with we're signing a deal with a company in Europe that will take care of Europe and Japan. And, you know, I mean, it's very important that we do a simultaneous release. Of, of course, they don't want to come out of here first. So we, <laughs> so, we'll, well, well, that was going to be my question. It, it, it's yeah. a simultaneous release, right? They're not getting it ahead of us, right? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> okay, good. We, we'll, we'll hang on the U.S. and Canada, and they'll take the rest of the world. I mean, I, I don't have a lot of inroads to how to promote the, you know, to Japan and Russia and all those guys. Right. So they'll take well, care of that. Yeah. I mean, there's the other side of that is once people get wind of it, you know what I mean? It's, it kind of just kind of catches fire anyways. Um, uh, grassroots, uh, viral, whatever you want to call it. Um, but the, your last album, you know, on my way to the sun um, was, it was, you did uh, uh, a Kickstarter fundraising right. for it and the fans pitched in to do that mm-hmm. um and the fans and, kicked in kicked in very well well that, uh, yes uh, more than enough for you to get it done I, I i know that but um the uh so your experience between doing an, an independent album like that and your upcoming album which i know like i said the label's not involved with it um and I, every artist i talk to about this they they always prefer having their own autonomy and their own control over the music. But, you know, explain the difference from your point of view, the difference between being able to control all that and do what you want to do versus having to kind of ride the guidelines of, and stay within the lanes of working with a label. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, That song that we will be fine that you played earlier. Mm -hmm. 
I sent to Phil Ehart, the drummer in Kansas. Right. Who's one of the founding members of, of Kansas. And, you know, those guys are pretty much landlocked right now. I mean, they're not doing anything. Right. And I sent him that song and he called me back like a day later. He says, I, I, yeah. Man, I mean, the stuff you're writing is really good. And he, and he, and he wants to start a, um, well, he's already had a company that plays the songs in movies. And um, he said, I'd like to get involved with you, man, because you, you, you know, you just write some, some really cool stuff. Where was I going with that? Um, <laughs> it was the difference between okay. doing it on your own versus having some record oh, oh, company tell you what to oh, do. Oh, oh, thanks, Mark. That's the difference between having it on my own. If I didn't have that song on my own, to be able to give to Phil, to give to a, to a movie, you know, to a, into a movie. I couldn't do that because right. I don't own it. Somebody right. else owns it. Somebody else has the copyright. Somebody else has paid for it. Somebody else will have to recoup for hundreds of thousands of dollars before I can have access to my own song. Right. On the Kickstarter project, I didn't have to do that. So it enables me to get the song out to more people with less restrictions or no restrictions. Right. So well, that's why I brought up the Philly Hero thing, because he can, he can take that song and say, hey, what do you think of this for, you know, yada, yada. And I could do it before I could never do it. Well, let's, let's talk about re your relationship with Phil, because, I mean, there's some things that, that I know. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how privy it is to the, to the public or how much you want to talk about it. But I, I don't know that a lot of people know that there was talk of you possibly rejoining Kansas when, when Steve retired or, or left the band. Um, and I know that was a tough decision for you, um, but um, do you want do you have anything to, to to say about that? I mean, was it a, a, in your mind? Um, did you think you made a good decision? Were you regretting that? Um, or are you just have well, a, I, you're still a healthy I, decision, a healthy I made, relationship? I, I made the decision definitely not to do it. Right. And I made the, there was a thing that came out, and I think it was. Uh, some some classic some prog rock magazine in Europe that said God told John not to join rejoin Kansas. It's like really, <laughs> oh, <God>. but <laughs> you know what? It just it, it it wasn't right for my life. Right. It just I mean, it's I mean, those guys tore man. They tore like crazy. Right. I mean, you you get on a, you get on a bus, you get an airplane, you're gone for two months. I'm just, I'm just not into that anymore. No, I mean, you got it. You, you, you play like right now, from what I witness, you play when you want to play and you play as much as you want to play or as little as yeah. you want to play. And, um, when you're in control of your own destiny, as far as, and, and, I'm, like, not, yeah. and I'm not just talking about financially, I'm talking about, uh, you know, professionally and, and cause it is filling the void of anybody with the, with the talent, um, that, that, that you have musically um, you, you know, you're not going to sit at home and, and waste the talents that God gave you. You're going to use them. But if you get to use them on your terms and not someone else's terms, I think you're, you feel extra blessed by being able to, to do something like that. No doubt. Yeah. I mean, I mean every uh, musician's looking for, I mean, ultimately wants to be able to do that. Right. So, well, I mean, there's a lot of people that say, why didn't you take the gig? I mean, my friend Dave Amato and Ario, oh, you should have taken that gig, man. You're the right guy for that. I mean, I mean, you, uh, yeah. you know, and, and we had this conversation several times, me and Dave Amato. Yeah. And I said, Dave, I just, I don't want to be owned. I want to own myself. I want to own my own time. I want to own when I make a soul, you know, as many records as I want to make. And I'm content. I mean, it's not like I'm. It's not, it's not like I'm just sitting home struggling for a gig. Right. You know what I mean? And I know, I know, I, I personally know that you, you struggle with that decision at that, that time. I, um, I, I, I do think because it's, it's tempting. Let's, let's face it. It's tempting. And you still got the pipes. Everybody know. I mean, everybody just heard coming in here. You still have the pipes to do it. Um, <laughs> maybe I know you're a little under weather right now, but maybe not right now, but I'm just saying that. Um, so, but I, Ultimately, I think you made the right decision because because of all the things we just talked about. I, and you brought up something else important. I appreciate that. And I think my family agrees. Yeah. I mean, fr so family, I, I, family I, first. I, family I, first. I, I sat my whole family down. I said, look, this is what's in front of me. Right. What do you guys think? And I mean, my, my, my kids are, how old are they? 24, 18, 
and 27 now. But I sat them all down. They, they said, Dad, do you like what you're doing? What do you want to change horses? If you dig what you're doing, just stay on the path. Right. You know, I mean, it, it, well, it wasn't that hard of a decision. Well, again, you know, I think when you're choosing family first uh, over those things and you're not doing it for the, the payola or the glamour or any of this other stuff, I think you're always making the right decision. So kudos uh, for doing that. But, you know, you, you mentioned uh, something else about, about Dave Amato. I, I'm not sure a lot of people know your relationship with Dave Amato, but, you know, Dave played with you in Mastodon. Um, now, I know he, he played in on the your most recent uh, version of, of Mastodon, but but did you play with him earlier as well, or how long have you known Dave? I've known Dave 35 years. Wow, okay. So about as long as me and Mark have known each other. <laughs> <Almost>. <laughs> in fact, Dave, here's how I met Dave Amato. I walked into a, uh, I think I was on a recess from a tour with Kansas. My um, My personal friend and personal roadie was with me. We went out to a club and we're sitting and there's nobody in the club. And there's this band with David Motto, uh, Jonathan Kane's brother, who they call Muggs, is on drums. And they start firing up fire with fire. It's like, what? <laughs> Wait, they're covering your song? <laughs> well, yeah, he knew I was, I was the only one there. How can he not notice? <laughs> That's so, funny. As soon as they finish the song, you know, they introduce me and say, John, if you want, we want us to do it again, man. Come up and sing. It's like oh, I have to now. <laughs> so ever since then, I was I've been best friends with Dave Amato. He's a dear friend. Yeah. And um, actually, Dave Amato, the very very first showcase after I left Kansas, we did for Geffen Records. Uh, he was my guitar player, and uh, what's her name? Betty Davis eyes. Um, yeah, Kim, uh, Kim Carnes. Kim Carr was yeah. there. She stole them out of my band. <laughs> and then we did another showcase about a year and a half later. And in comes the guys with, uh, I think it was uh, MCA Records, with Cher. In comes walking Cher. Yeah. <laughs> and then she stole Dave Amato. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Not the way it is. The next thing I know, he's with Ted Nugent, and then he's with... Um, Bon Jovi's guitar player. What's his name? I'm not, uh, Richie Sam. Richie Sam. Yeah. Richie Sam. You know, I'm in the early stages of the Manchester Fellows. Uh, <laughs> You're not no, that old yet. <laughs> um, so then they steal them, and but they, I mean, this is all in good fun, man. I, I was so happy. Every 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 time David Mono reached a different plateau, I was so happy for him, man. Right. And then he joined REO. He's been with REO 30 years. Oh, I know, forever. I mean, Gary Richrath has been out for a while. So, and he's, he was, the, you know, the, Gary's replacement. So, uh, been there forever. Oh, Dave, so. Dave's great, man. Yeah. He seems like a really nice guy as well. He was, so, he, uh, I talked to him a couple nights ago, and we could never have short conversations or as we're long. He said, I said, Dad, Dave, I'm making a new record. He went, What? <laughs> can't, I, I can't repeat his vernacular, but. <laughs> What the, what the F are you talking about? What, what, how come I'm not effing on playing on it? What, are you going to send it to me? Come on, man. What the F's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> Dave, it's just, all, it's just all unfolding, you know, by itself. Well, you, I mean, you seem to gather around a lot of uh, very uh, strong musicians. Uh, you know, John Schlitt, I know he's really good friends with him. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, at, at the band that, I one of the tightest bands I think you play with and musicians you play with that nobody... I don't want to say nobody, but not a lot of people have heard of is Six Wire, and those guys in Six Wire are pretty, pretty darn talented, man. They, they're, oh, uh, gosh. they're so Each tight. One of those guys in that band has a major pedigree. Yeah, was it? Was that a band that, if I remember correctly, years ago there was sort of like a battle to bands TV show, yeah. like on a Friday yeah, night, and they a, were country like, band that, that went yeah, to like the a, finals. Best band in America, or something America's, like that. America's, yeah. America's. Greatest, something. yeah, America's greatest band or something right. like that. Yeah, they were yeah. really good. Yeah, well, that's uh, they back John a lot, and uh, I mean, John, you played it. Do I, do I do. Pat, I probably do twenty five shows a year with those guys. And uh, you, 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 you do the uh, Patrick Warburton uh, charity golf event uh, with with them. Uh, Patrick, 
again, I mean, I just have an affinity for St. Jude Hospital. I, I love the work that they do. And for him to raise that money for St. Jude and Patrick, I know from other people that I know that know him, a really solid stand up guy. But that's supposed to be a really fun event. They, they've had a lot of big, talented people play oh, man. that event. Uh, you know, Robbie Krieger cool. from The Doors even has played there multiple times. I mean, you can go on and on mentioning the, the, the people that played oh, that event. Huey Lewis. Yeah. Um, Tommy Johnson, the original singer in the Doobies. Um, who's the guy from, um, um, oh gosh, just some serious player. Uh, um, Alice Cooper, of course. Yeah. I mean, Alex, you, Lives, Alex Lifeson from I, Rush. I, really? I never saw him there. That's, that's Steven, awesome. Even Steven Stills. Right. I mean, I look over like, that's Steven Stills. He's going, <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, you know, you're always in good company. I mean, you you played the the Kentucky Derby what a couple of times now the the gala the big red carpet gala event how many times? Four times. Four times now. So I mean, and I know we won't we won't go down the road. You told me this a really funny 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 story about Robin Thick that was hysterical. Oh my God, I I just oh, might God. drop into my knee. I, we won't call him. I, he'll probably never see this, but we don't have to go down that story. But you had a great story about Robin Thick uh, and Dennis DeYoung. Uh, during the, the well, first, never, I think it was the first time I, I, you played I never had the pleasure of meeting him personally. Right. But, no, you, sure but you met his entourage. <laughs> I met his entourage, yes. Uh, can, we, can we just talk a little bit about just like a second? They're never going to see this. But I, and we won't have to go into the whole story. But it was based... It was they, based were, they, were, they were pompous, man. Oh, it was, his, it was his entourage coming in basically saying, you know, that... that uh, well, you tell me, like, like nobody bother <laughs> Robin because he's... What a... <laughs> we each had a half an hour sound check. Right. And me and Dennis Young were waiting on the sidelines because it was going to be Robin Thick. And then Dennis, and I wanted to see, I wanted to see Dennis's sound check. Right. And then it was going to be me. I mean, Dennis had his stuff down. He's a pro. It probably was going to take 15 minutes. Right. And I was going to do my sound check with a band, but Robin Thicke's band came up and they didn't know a song. So they, they rehearsed for close to three hours. <laughs> instead of a sound check. It was a rehearsal instead of a sound check. <laughs> and, and what they did, it was like, they put like this barrage of people around them. Like, so nobody would shut him down. <laughs> But uh, it, was, it was crazy. Yeah. I mean, do you said something like his entourage said something about, you know, don't bother Robin because he's been nominated for so many Grammys and you oh like God. thought in your head, like you just wanted to tell them, well, yeah, well, I, I have four Grammys. So <laughs> whatever. I mean, but, you know, obviously being the, the Christian you are, but <laughs> and that's, that's something you could have easily thrown in their face. I've been tempted to say a lot of things, but I, I, <laughs> I, re I refrain these days. I, but yeah, I mean, it just goes to show you what other people are like in this industry. You know, you can either walk the walk the humble road or walk the the road of like I don't know anybody else because there's nobody else that can touch me road. And uh, you know, God bless you for the road that you walk, which is the humble road. Well, you know, so. what's sad about Robin is, is, is I mean, the guy's talented, man. Yeah, and the guy's really talented. And when he went on, my wife and I are sitting in the back because I had already done my set, and we're sitting in the back, and he does this one hit song. And then nobody else knew anything else he was playing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't even like the hit, but I know a lot of, obviously I was on the charts. Well, for, he got sued for six million bucks for that. So yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but what I what I didn't like so much about him, which got on my nerves was when, didn't he get caught? Like he, he was getting divorced. His wife was divorcing him. I think he was running around and that, and then all of a sudden, in all of his concerts, they're recording him. He's pleading to take for her to take him back on every. You know, yeah. he just made it. Yeah, and he went on talk shows and plead. I mean, he just went out there, and was just like begging in front of the camp every night, every show. And really? probably it was right after that hit sh hit song because then nobody, probably everybody else started walking out and leaving. <laughs> but, I, I mean, he went to like I'm. I mean, it was like a. It was like a six-month promotion of him just doing nothing but just begging in front of his audience to bring for her to come back. And, of course, she <laughs> never came back. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't. Well, I think he realizes now what a mistake that Miley Cyrus thing was. Oh, I think Miley Cyrus finally realizes what a mistake that was, too. <laughs> uh, thankfully. I think she's thankfully trying to turn her life around. But um, I mean, I was I was. I don't even think my kids were in the room and, and my wife and I were blushing. It's like, what? Oh, that was what pathetic. That? I mean, it was absolutely pathetic. 
And uh, it's, what's funny was just uh, this past weekend, uh, my daughter who goes to Penn State, um, uh, Billy Ray Cyrus did a special acoustic live. How's her team doing? What's that? Uh, How's her team doing? Let's, let's not talk about it. They suck. Right, this oh, my gosh. But um, <laughs> they, uh, anyways, so Billy Ray Cyrus was playing uh, just for the Penn State students. Uh, over the weekend and he, it looked like he was like sitting in the corner of a like an attic somewhere and, and playing acoustic guitar but um you know that guy is just you know you wonder like that that miley that that apple fell so far from the tree <laughs> from where billy ray is uh billy ray's i mean he's singing amazing grace on this on you know on his uh streaming you know what i mean for these kids at penn state and stuff and i'm thinking myself and then i started talking to my daughter and she she's like Miley's not the same Miley she used to be. She's changed a lot. I'm like, oh, I haven't. I'll tell you, she, it. she can definitely sing, though, man. Like, oh, she's got, so she's got so much talent. She's got so much talent. On that music show that she's on, what is it? She's doing a voice now. And, that, and she seems actually pretty pretty cool with everybody. You know what I mean? She seems she, oh, she seems she, to be doing everything she can. To well, I'm, help hoping these she kids I'm hoping well, she comes around. I'm hoping she comes around. I'll draw a good example, I, I think, hopefully. Uh, she's young, man. What is she? Twenty-five. She's something like that. Yeah, she's she, she's very young. I was twenty-five. Yeah. You couldn't tie my shoes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, exactly. I think <laughs> that. Um, and if anybody if anybody disputes this, they're lying. My brother Dino discovered Katy Perry. Really? Her name was Katie Hudson. Right, I know that. Saw her saw her at a church in L.A. She was warming up a. a Five band showcase. She was only the warm up. She did three songs on acoustic, yada yada. And the showcase got over with. And my brother Dino said, Who's that little girl that warmed up the show? Oh, that's Katie Hudson. Or, you know, her and her parents are part of the church. And he said, Can I meet with her? And so I think he stayed he stayed over a day after and met with her and her parents. And then she flew out to Nashville and we signed her to our label and she did two records for us, but I see uh, to make, you know, to fast forward. I see her. I see Katy Perry coming around. Really? I and, hope so. And as a she, believer in Christ, we need to keep her in prayer because she's a big influence over young gals. Yeah. Much like Miley, Miley. But I mean, yeah, I mean, she was when, before she became known as Katy Perry, she was uh, singing. Uh, she sang a song with P.O.D., you know, um, back up and she was going down that road. She was going down that, that, that Christian music road. And well, she, took, she definitely took a left turn, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, you know, what? she's not, she, I think she's going to come back around. I, I, I mean, I would have to say that we're, we're going to all be blown away when she comes back around. I think she's going to come back around in a big way. I, I love it that these young girls, like I said, that do have the revelation. I mean, uh, you have, um, oh crap, what's her name that was on uh, Wizards of Waverly Place? My my daughters are going to disown me for not remembering her name. Um, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. But anyways, like that that um, that she is now like singing and like there's there's viral videos of her singing in church, you know, and, and singing gospel music and stuff like that. Oh, Selena Gomez. And, oh uh, really? Yeah. There's this is there's viral videos of her singing uh, gospel music in church, and I'm like that. That just like warms my heart that that those that they're being touched at that early age to be influenced you, to go yeah, down that road. Michael, you know it's interesting. You say I'll tell you what I think happens because I've been there. Yeah. You get there, so to speak. Make a lot of money. I mean, I've, I've never been as you know, as popular as Katy Perry or Selena Gomez, but you get there, you get to the top and you go, wow. Um, is this all it is? Is this the pinnacle of everything? And then you start questioning yourself going, am I supposed to be happier now because I have millions of dollars and I have millions of fake friends? I mean, is this all there is? I mean, that, that's where I went. And I, I, I think people, you know, people like that just, they start realizing that, you know, there's got to be more to it than this. I mean, can this possibly be a lie I bought into? That doesn't, well, mean, you stop, that doesn't mean you stop making records and you stop singing. 
et cetera, et cetera. Well, especially the, the only thing like you should be questioning yourself is like when you're in the middle of making the video for Fight Fire with Fire, did you question anybody to say, what the hell are we doing here? What is this video about? How did you jump to that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that, that's one of the... Did you, problem, did you have a problem with that big mosquito? No. <laughs> Was that a mosquito? Dog? Uh, I mean, mosquito, yeah, 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 I know, but and it, it, it was so. But here's the great thing about that video. I, I'm one, like I remember watching Mark, that video about a year or so ago. Are you in the same room with him. <laughs> no. You give me a little. Like my, my uncle's used to say, give me a little scoffoon. I, I will say this: it is so 80s. That's that video. That it's like I wish that someone right now would it make a video. 80s. I, I get that, but I, I wish that someone right now would make an homage to those '80s videos that just made no sense, like you know, "Rocky Like a Hurricane" video and stuff like that. Well, they, it was better than men with hats. Men without hats. <laughs> and anything was better better than them, <laughs> in my opinion, anyhow. But no, I'm just ripping. I'm ripping on you. That was just, it was a very '80s uh -huh. video, man. But what, like, I'm wondering what goes through the the the, the artist's mind of like, what are we doing here? What are we actually doing? Or are you just like following orders? You're like, okay, we do this, we're doing. Yeah, that. we were just following orders. All right. <laughs> it's pretty funny though we didn't know what the end result that what you know that they had in their mind we, right. we, didn't, we didn't have any idea uh no you wish you had creative like control over stuff like that back hey, do then. you have any folks in the room with us tonight any what do you have any folks in the room with us tonight any folks no it's just us right now and, and our viewing audience and obviously. my dog's on my uh couch i'm down in my basement in my music room but is anybody here. watching the show not live and they'll, they'll watch it next week whenever this thing oh, okay. airs so uh yeah but we, have, always, we have we have we have thousands of viewers so i always love taking live questions yeah no we can't do that on this show we've, we've talked about doing an actual live show and maybe we'll get around to doing that maybe in uh, our second season this actually by the way is our our uh finale for this year our first season wrap-up and that's why we're making it like an extra long uh episode uh, featuring uh, the the wonderful John Alfonte here and Lacey Sturm coming up a little bit later. Um, we wanted to go out big, go out because 2020 just needs some sort of big exit, you know, and what Absolutely. better way to do that with them with you guys on here on this show. I appreciate that. But, uh, you know, John, I mean, and, you know, I, you know, you need to get back. I mean, when things start getting back to normal, you need to get your butt back to Pittsburgh or I need to get back down to Nashville. I will say, though, that the last time you were here was about five years ago and we hung out together. The last time I was in Nashville, you blew me off. So that's, you know, that's all I got to say about that. Hey, you know what? <laughs> what can I say? Well, you know, I, I don't... a little typhoon. <laughs> I don't blame you for that. Hey, uh, as far as, uh, you know, I know, like, you go out and you, like, your big thing right now is uh, you do a lot of th these classic rock shows when you were making, when you know, before the COVID shut down, you were doing these classic rock shows. A lot of them. And, uh, you know, I know that, like, even when you were in Pittsburgh, you you, you were playing with the, 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 like, the symphony here, but then you had a band, but then you were doing not just Kansas stuff, but you were doing Journey stuff, you're doing all kind of old classic rock yeah. stuff, Toto, whatever. Um, but so when you're, when you're, you, you still got your pipes, but is there, um, is there something like there's, is there a Kansas song that you like want to do live that you just can't do anymore or that you wish you could do or, or is everything in the, in the, nah, on the, on the table? Really. I mean, when I go out, I just try to do the most popular ones, point in a return, wayward son, hold on, fight, right. fire, fire, play the game tonight. Wayward now, son. <laughs> You know. My my personal favorite song that you've ever done is uh and since the time you did this Chasing Shadows, Chasing Shadows just my ultimate favorite Kansas John Elefante Kansas song uh, that there is. Uh, what I about you? Do, do you have a favorite song, or is that your favorite song? I used to love singing a song that I didn't originally sing, and I didn't write called No One Together. Oh, great song! Love that song. But uh Time to ease them back when ways and many nights and I lost who can count a good man when they're gone. Yeah, I the remember fruits of all I don't know the words. I remember when I first uh when I was a youngster, I learned that whole uh song on, on the uh the bass, that and Song for America. When I learned <laughs> it on the bass. <laughs> yeah. I mean I, so many people think of uh you know 
they they only, they put Kansas in this little box of like like five songs, you know, Dust in the Wind and Point of No Return and 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 uh, Carry Them Away with Not a real game, stuff. They're you. they're I mean, like Kansas is a really, <laughs> they're a progressive rock band, and if you you know that by listening to the music and listening to those bass riffs and listening to the drums and the and the keyboards and it's really progressive for especially for its time. You know, I still I still talk to Carrie all the time. Yeah, well, I know you got a great relationship with Carrie. Yeah. I, I sang on uh, three songs recently on a solo record he's putting out, and I sang on um, the voice of Lazarus on his cantata. Well, was was he? Um, am I remembering correctly? Did he uh, help out with one or or two things with uh, on my way to the sun, or was he was he involved well, he, with uh, on my way? No, on my way to the sun was Rich Williams. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. David Ragsdale. Yeah, and there, there's a the couple songs that, on there that are very Kansas-ish. Yeah. The record that Kerry played on was, we just released it on an LP. It's a double album. Have you seen it? Uh, the, uh, was it Mastodon? Mastodon? Mastodon Mast yeah, the new Mastodon, yeah. right. I, I haven't heard any of the music on it. Mastodon 3, which, which came out 2010, I believe. Oh, wait, maybe that, yeah, I did hear that. I thought this was a new one that you guys released, so... This is the one back when we had Dave, Dave Amata back in the band and stuff. Yeah, I remember that. Right, Dave was on that record. Carrie Ligman played on it. Okay. Um, but we just put it on LP. It's a double record. It's, it's I, awesome. I saw your post on it. It looked pretty, like the LP looked pretty cool, man. It looked pretty badass. Yeah, it's, it's I just got it, um, I got it in the mail. I was blown away. Yeah, that's awesome. So, um, I mean, how many songs do you think are going to be on this new uh, record of yours uh, you've got coming out? I mean, you, do you have a title picked out yet for the album, or is it that's still up in the air? Or um, we're still we're still kind of floating it all around. So, what are you what are you thinking um, about? Ten tracks or or more 11, or eleven probably, tracks? Yeah, yeah. I think well, since it's been. What, what do we say, 2013 from On My Way to the Sun? So seven years, I think uh, people are itching for something new from you. I mean... It's, it's going to be a cool record. I mean, it's... I know through the years you've, you've done like one-offs and stuff like that, um, especially since this is Christmas time. If anybody wants to hear John, uh, there's plenty of Christmas music out there that John has done over the years. Uh, you know, Silent Night, Oh Come All You Faithful. And even uh, you did a, a cover of the, the Charlie Brown classic christmas time is here which oh, is I love that. great great version of that song too by the Are way you guys I, still see me because i lost you no i see you no we see you yeah i don't know so me okay. um but um so there's plenty of uh, uh of christmas stuff out there for for the fans to go and catch uh whether you want to look it up on youtube or itunes or i'm sure it's available somewhere sometimes those those old um, one-off songs aren't available on iTunes or Spotify or anything like that, but you can sometimes find them uh, via YouTube. Somebody posts them. A lot of times, uh, I, I don't know, I subscribe to YouTube Music, which used to be Google Play. Now they're pushing everybody over to YouTube. There's a there's stuff there. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, John, is there anything else you want to uh, promote for anybody? Why don't we, uh, you at least uh, put up your, uh, we'll, we'll say uh, your your Facebook page, uh, what is what is it at John Elfonte? Yeah, JohnElfonte.com, But there's there's really no we haven't posted anything new because we have a lot of stuff coming out that's new. Right. And when um, uh, when when the new album comes out, is it uh, going to be available for like you know, on iTunes and Spotify oh, yeah. or and all those? Uh, We're going to do a full LP, uh, CD, a track, cassette. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't, heard, I haven't heard anybody trying to bring back the A-track. Well, My, hey, why, why the heck not, right? What I always hated you know. was when you would have a, one of your favorite songs, and every now and then you'd get that A-track where that song would end on a one track and fade out, and you wait for it to click over, and it would start back <laughs> up. I mean, that was just ridiculous. <laughs> they could have come up with something better. I like whenever uh, you try to uh, find, uh, find the one song on the cassette that you wanted to listen to, and it's like... Nope. I'll, I'll, never, I'll never forget. I'll never forget the Yes record. I mean, roundabout. Morning, summer, down and down and in and out the. You know. <laughs> <Dolly>! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, those. I mean, we don't uh, in in the digital world, and uh, even well, even with the CDs when they first came out, we don't really have to deal with that anymore. Thank thank God. Well, guys, but, let's um, all pray that that 2021 is better than 2020. It's it's absolutely. gotta be, dude. It's just it just absolutely. has to be. It actually it's absolutely has to be. Nine months. Um, you know, like I said, with the with uh, my, we, my last my last show was oh, was it was Six Wire St. Jude, um, March 9th. Well, I heard uh, news coming out of uh, I think it was um, was it live events or was it uh, Ticketmaster? Live Nation. Know, live Nation. Live Nation said that uh, they foresee a way to bring live concerts back and by summer of 2021. So and they're, they're talking about doing um, COVID tests before you can get in the building. Well, they're when, right now they're doing something scientific where they're they're doing research on uh, the aerosol releasing of uh, of you know massive amounts of people together and what the reaction of that is, so that they can find a way to better protect the people in the crowd. Uh, you know, during that, and as well as, you know, scanning people for fevers and stuff like that coming into the show. But they seem very optimistic that they can bring live uh, concerts back by summer of 2021. So let's pray that that happens. And, uh, that, you know, you, you need to get back on the road. And um, I lost, gosh, I had 30 or 35 shows booked. Yeah. Well, if things get ever too bad, you can oh, sell a few of those gold records behind you there. My wife's getting real tired of me. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a story around the world, isn't it? <laughs> There's a whole lot of wives that are like, we're, like tired of their husbands. She, she's finding faults with me that I didn't even know I had. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, we're we're all trying to find new hobbies and stuff like that. But that that's that's what spawned this whole entire show is uh, was COVID. If it wasn't yeah. for COVID, we wouldn't have the Black Brain Show. So actually, it's not a bad thing overall. But uh, we're we're looking for a, a brighter 2021. And uh, look, we all know at the end of the day who's in charge. That man is still you know on the my phone. Memory of 20, my memory of 2020 is going to be. This the <laughs> our show. <laughs> no, you're not going to believe this. The Hallmark Channel. What? You watch a lot of those. I love it. Christmas. I know what's going to happen. It's a no-brainer. I don't have to think. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were watching those Christmas shows in July when they were showing it, weren't you? Oh, you know it. <laughs> You know what? I've, I've become real good friends with this guy that's like got a hundred million dollar contract in, in Las Vegas. His name's Terry Fader. Have you seen that guy? Oh yeah, America's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah. Second He's season champ. Good friends. We're texting each other back and forth every day. Him and I are Hallmark buddies. Him and his wife are like Hallmark. Right. We've seen all this. Uh, what am I talking about? I mean, it's it's <laughs> it, it, uh, it, it's so different. It's so detached from reality. Kind of like the Bachelorette. Like, why don't you be watching that? You might as well be watching the Bachelorette. <laughs> it's, it's so detached from reality that it's soothing. Oh man, John, listen to me, buddy. You need to get out. <laughs> you need to get out of the house. <laughs> we went out to dinner last night. Oh, they, you mean you have dine-in places down there? Because our, our, our oh, yeah, jackass governor shut everything down. We can't dine in anywhere here. So. At least you got that going for you. Well, I, I think I, I think we could do fifty percent capacity. Yeah, well, we could until Saturday. So, the Saturday oh, we got they, we they got pulled, shut down. They pulled the rug out. Yeah, Saturday. again, again, even after a court already came in and, and told him, slapped his hand, and said you can't do that because it's unconstitutional, and he did it again anyways. So whatever. Let's not go there because otherwise this will be a three-hour uh, episode. Are you <laughs> Are you in Pennsylvania? You guys in Pennsylvania? Yeah, yeah. Governor That's Wolf. Uh, the, I, I, why, why the, why the members uh, don't? Uh, there's, there was talk of trying to impeach him. They should. Otherwise, we're stuck with him for two more years. Yeah, I think we're stuck with him for two. Yeah. More. The biggest problem is it's not even, it's, it's not the restaurants that are the problem. It's the idiots that don't want to do anything is the problem. Right. The, the restaurants are doing what they, yeah, exactly, they be doing. It's the, it's trying to control the. Idiots that are screwing it up for 
everybody else that aren't even in the restaurant. Well, look, while, while we're talking about this, let's just get this out there because, and we got to wrap here, but I know that, but, um, if no, you looked, I'm I, lo- I, I looked I'm at all night. <laughs> you're welcome to stay all night. Well, I don't care how if we lose anybody or if we gain if we more people. This stuff, you're never gonna get it. <laughs> Look, I saw that I'm, I'm a data guy, I'm a numbers guy. Mark will tell you this, and he and I have talked a lot about numbers and data and stuff like this, right? You, you know, they uh, they came out with a, this uh, the um, numbers for contact tracing. And the number one contact tracing of people having COVID is from fa- large family get togethers and gatherings and stuff like this. The second is like events where people are, are gathered together. You know what's near the bottom of the list of contact tracing? Restaurants and bars. It's like 1% people getting COVID from going to restaurant and bars. Where is the science and data to say, don't go to restaurants and bars because you may get COVID if only 1% of the people that are getting COVID or getting him from restaurants and bars. You answer me that. But you can go riot. Oh, yeah. You can go riot all you want. You just can't go to a restaurant or a bar. I haven't spent much time in restaurants or bars once they open. I'm surely not going to riot. <laughs> 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 I don't care whether it's safe or you can get sick or not. You know, I have no, I'm not into that type of thing. You know, Are you, you able to see our screen down there, John? Yeah. You able to see us again? Yeah, I can see. Okay, oh, yeah. Mike, before I forget, Mike wanted me to show you. I'm drinking this Tennessee small batch whiskey, uh, Uncle Ernest. I mean, nearest. Mike wanted me to show you this glass that I'm, I picked up oh, when I was Christmas shopping. It was a Mike, rocks glass. Get, get down and I'll, I'll, I'll step on it. I it's a two pack for 30 bucks. <laughs> we got the terrible towel. We got the Steeler glasses. We know you hate the Steelers. Wait, and hang on. No, I'll be right back. Oh, geez. Here we go. <laughs> Look, okay, this this has gone on long enough. I think we're going to about end it right now because otherwise <laughs> this is just going to get ugly. We, oh, geez, oh, man. <laughs> Look at that. Not a scratch on it, which is like typical for the Titans, right? <laughs> if that was a game worn, that, that's probably a game worn hel- helmet right there with uh, no blemishes on it. Yeah, it's Derrick Henry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What are you trying to say? That nobody touches him, right? <laughs> so that's that's why there's no blemishes on the helmet. Derek, nobody can touch Derek you know, Henry. What cracks me up about watching these games, guys, is they make them put these masks on on the sidelines. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. And then they go out in the game, they spit it, spit in each other's face. <laughs> I know they're gonna try to, I guess, do something. They but. take they take the they take the mask off. And they get out there and they're rolling around on the field, spitting each other's face. I mean, come on. What? I, I personally like the piped in crowd noise. That's my favorite. You that know, would be least. a good business to get into. If you could put together the right stuff to, in the studio to sell to these stadiums, or even maybe on a lower level, like the smaller division two and three colleges right. and, you know, for football games and put and pipe that sound in. No, I don't know. Penn State needs something. They need some sort of boost. Okay, yeah, Tennessee. Excuse me. What's the Tennessee Titans record? What is, what's the Steelers record? Uh, uh, yeah, stink. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, the last couple of weeks, yes, they, the Steelers have stunk, but uh, we we're, yeah, we're they always come through though. Yeah, we're going we're going to come. Can't through. put them down. And, and John and I love ribbing each other during uh, Predators and Steelers and Titans games and stuff like that, and it's all in good fun. Um, I don't know, you know where hockey's going, man. Jeez. Well, they're 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 starting the new season supposedly uh, early yeah, January. Full arenas, right? No, I mean, but it'll be like the, like it was before. But um, we'll see. You know, I'm, I'm you know we're hockey fans, we're football fans. So I'm looking around the room to see if I have any Pred stuff. Oh, I'll show you this though. I know what you don't have. You don't have a Stanley Cup anything. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I have this. Well, yeah, you got Jerry Rice there. All right. Pretty okay. cool, huh? Well, why, why is there a giant sign behind Jerry Rice? I don't know. Your wishful thinking that he played for the Giants, maybe. That was at the Super Bowl in 99. It was, it was that, uh, what do they call that little bonanza that they do at the Super Bowl? The, I mean, when the Titans went to the Super Bowl in 99 with the Rams. They have yeah. all these. You know, yeah, I know what it, I can't remember right what it's called. Yeah, they have like their press week or whatever. They're, I got to throw a pass to him, and he dropped it. Probably, probably was thrown three feet over his head. <laughs> <laughs> he was thrown at his feet. <laughs> well, that makes just about as much of sense. 
So, all right, John. Hey, well, thanks so much for coming on the show here. We really appreciate it. And when your uh, when your new album comes out, I think we'll have to have you back. Well, on I want to we'll... dig around a little more. Here. <laughs> 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 we got plenty of time to do that via text messages. Well, you know, no, there's, I appreciate there's, there's that. still there's still some football left over, and uh, look, I, I, you know, God willing, that the things are going to eventually. I'm not a fan of the new normal. I don't believe there's a new normal. I think we will get back to what it was before, and uh, you'll be playing in front of people. As I said before, I could stand on one leg for five years. I could, you know, whatever. I blink my eyes five years go by. I look, my daughter's in college for crying out loud. She was just born the other day. From, you know, you know what I'm, <laughs> you're, you're a grandfather now for crying. You've been a grandfather for a couple of years already, you know. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, you know what I'm talking about here. Yeah, let's but, see. Yeah. So it, it won't be long uh, for, before you're back out uh, playing in front of the crowds again. So... Can you see that? Oh, look at that. How old is she? Two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. Well, you're blessed. You're blessed. Look at that. Beautiful. Beauty. Takes after her uh, her, her grandmother. Well, and, well, and mother. <laughs> Not after her grandfather. <laughs> Actually, my daughter's adopted, so I, I... I know. Well, I know that. <laughs> We know the whole, well. If hey, if anybody wants to know the story of that, just go uh, watch the the long version of uh, this time by John Elefante from On My Way to the Sun. You'll hear the whole backstory uh, behind that song. I recommend it to everybody. Um, it's a wonderful, heart touching story about uh, how he uh, adopted his his daughter. A little, a little disturbing how YouTube took three million views away from us, but. Well, you know, again, you got to take that with a grain of sand because that's just YouTube and they stink. You no, know, with the Michael Adam cares. Long as I know. Still- Everybody knows what you did. You know, you were on Mike Huckabee and when you were on Mike Huckabee, you know, a million people saw it just off of that show alone. So uh, people, people know the song, they know the story, but if you, if you want to seek it out, if you haven't heard it yet, go to YouTube and search for uh, this time and watch the long version of it. And, and uh, you'll, you'll hear the story behind it. And uh, John, uh, you're a brother in Christ, uh, a good friend, and I appreciate you coming on the show and I uh, love you. And um, hope you have a Merry Christmas and uh, and a very blessed New Year for you and your whole entire family. And we, uh, well, like I said, we'll circle back around with you when your album comes out. And I hope that it does uh, yeah, tremendous yeah. for you. All right. And uh, stay tuned. We'll have uh, Lacey Sturm and Josh Sturm coming up next on this expanded edition of the Blabber Brain Show. We'll be right back. Blabber Brains. Welcome back to the season finale of the Blabberbrain Show. And uh, we are really excited to bring in our next guest, uh, the legendary vocalist, uh, author, uh, songwriter. Uh, you're, I mean, look, you're, you're at, at this point in time, you're both legendary. Lacey and Josh Sturm, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give a nice big round of applause. Everyone. Thank you, guys. We're one now. We've been married almost 13 years. So. <laughs> We're kind of one now. I get to take all of her accolades with me. <laughs> Did, did it did it take 13 years to get there? Uh, yeah, actually. Uh, it did. <laughs> all of the 13 years. Okay. Well, that's all. Did awesome. you have to kind of combine your names like all the other famous people out there? Yeah. What would power that, what, couples. What would that combo be? Uh, uh, Joshy. It's not very cute. Joshy, no. Leish. Leish. Leishua. Maybe. Leishua. Oh, just doesn't Leishua. seem to roll off the tongue, guys. Does, it doesn't. doesn't. I'll we'll have to try to figure something else out anyways so uh yeah it's awesome having you guys on um you know this is these are crazy times right so we we need inspirational people to uh you know lift everybody up uh from the tough times that we're in right now and uh you know i can't think of anybody i personally know that's that's more inspiring than not just Lacey because of your your life and because of your music but josh you as well um, uh, you know, you guys, uh, you know, doing the reflect love back and everything, um, you know, that's really inspiring for everybody. But uh, musically, I mean, you guys really are a, a team and you've been a team for for a while. Um, so how does that work like musically when you guys are, are working together? Is it Lacey comes up with the idea? You come up with the idea? Is it, is it split? Is it working together? It's because uh, when that, whenever I see you guys doing live streams and it's almost just like, and you're doing just things off the cuff and it just seems like so natural and you're just like diddling around and stuff. So how does it that usually also, work? That also took 13 years for us. To 
<laughs> we fought every time we tried to play music together. Well, first of all, we never played music together for like the first four or five years. No, wait, how long? Probably four or five years of our marriage, we never played music together. Wow. Something she did, you know, because she was leaving Flyleaf and I was quit playing music at the time. So it just, it was an obvious thing. We just never did it. And then right. we tried doing it and uh, had very different approaches, right? What's your approach? Well, I think our problem was we were both trying to follow the other one. Accommodate each other. And it was just so frustrating. I'm like, I'm trying to do what you're doing. And he's like, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm trying to do what you're doing. And I'm like, does it work? Pull the leader and nobody's leading type <laughs> right. thing. Yeah. And honestly, we, we fought every time. And then we finally figured out. She just, you know, had, had said that one day. And I finally figured, okay. I'm just going to play what I think is good. And if she doesn't like it, she'll tell me to change it. Yeah. Cause I'd change it. Cause I thought she didn't like it. She goes, why'd you change that? You know, and <laughs> guitar down. I don't want to do this anymore type <laughs> thing. It was not easy. Listen, if you, if, uh, yeah, lots of things in marriage are not easy writing music together and playing. Yeah. That took us at least 10 years to be able to like flow like that. And actually, and he's like, and I'm like, can you play this song? Like on stage, he's like, I didn't, I didn't work that. I don't, I didn't, I didn't practice, you know, like that's, that song's right. not in the set. What are you talking about? I'm like, right. I just I just want to see you play it. <laughs> like, I'm on so, the stage. Yeah. You're a freaking <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. With, yeah, there are, you know, those of us that, that you know, we, we don't just know every single song in the whole entire history of the universe. It's just, you know, we got to learn certain, certain things. <laughs> so, like, well, I mean, like, I mean, right now, nobody's playing out or doing anything. Um you know, I, and I know you guys are, are trying to keep busy with doing stuff. And I know you, you know, Josh, you're, you're recording in the studio. Lacey, you've been writing and stuff like that. But uh, are you guys still prepping for the time when you can go back out? Or are you you're still building on, on new songs and stuff like that? I'm not counting on being able to go out again. Which okay. <laughs> maybe that sounds a little uh, grim. Pessimistic. <laughs> Pessimistic. <laughs> um, but honestly... I've, I've always enjoyed just recording and writing in general. And so the touring part, I thought I loved touring, but I realized that I'm not as much of a fan of touring as I thought I was, especially having three kids. It's, it's not easy. Oh, yeah. you know? It's like, and so I think that um, we are writing and doing a lot of stuff right now, but I don't know that we're making many plans to be able to tour that. It's, you know, nobody can really make solid plans at the moment. Right. Um, we are proceeding forward with music as far as taking it to the live stage. I don't know. What does that look like? I think they're sorting out ways to do that. I think probably by the time it's warm, they'll probably figure out a way to put everybody six feet apart in an arena outside, you know, or something like that if we wanted to, but. Yeah. I know live nation said their work live nation said they're, they, they're pretty optimistic that concerts will resume in like this by the summer of 2021. Uh, I even heard today something about they're going to be using this technology that they're using at uh, like a lot of universities in the, um, and, and pros in the, uh, with sports and it's this drone type of thing that like does ultraviolet lay, uh, rays uh, and kind of scans everything and, and sanitizes everything. And they're talking about like, I don't know how safe this is or whether people be on board with it, but uh, like, like if you have like a football stadium with fans or whatever, or, or a concert with people there, there'd be this drone flying around that's constantly scanning people and, and, and having this ultraviolet lay, ray, you know, light going out. I don't know how safe that is, but that's they're, it. They're experimenting with it right Just now. Just make sure that you have an overhang wherever you're playing. Make sure there's a top and you're not yeah. out there just in case that's going on so it could ricochet <laughs> off the roof. Yeah, and I was going to say, there's going to be those people with like the tinfoil hats playing. They're not yeah. going to be <laughs> Literally, yeah. No, um, no, they might. There's a Portlandia episode. <laughs> Literally, you have to watch it after it's over. There's a Portlandia episode where they talk about going to festivals and how annoying it is to park and all this other stuff. And you can just sit on your couch and wear a VR mask and fly a drone to the concert and get your own position. Oh, you can go there without being there. Well, what, what good is that? You might as well just watch the video on YouTube or something like that. That's just dumb. It's not too far away from what we're talking about here. Right. It, I don't know. Whatever. That's annoying. Hopefully, uh, one way or the other, I think that things will, will eventually resume. Whether you guys decide to go back out or not, it's going to be you know your call what you want to do. But as long as the music keeps flowing... And keeps coming. I mean, you released uh, the decree not long ago, which is a uh, absolutely amazing song. And um, wish I, we had a way to 
play it here right now for, for everybody, but um, and, you know, just go out there and check it out on, on YouTube, just everybody. Click the link right here. Yeah, right there. <laughs> make, that, make that happen. I'll put that in post. I'll put a link right there. Do it in post. So, uh, no, it's a, it's a really uh, amazing song. It's, it's funny because anytime I have that song on and it's just like, it's kind of like this build up, you know, and then, uh, and then the scream comes in. It's like, you know, even like gets my kids like, what? you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of like startles them or something. And uh, what are you yelling? You're on help, right? At the, at the beginning there with the loud scream. But it's, it's I don't know. I, I love that kind of stuff. And, um, but I, one thing I want to talk about with that song, because you recorded that in, in your home. And I was just blown away whenever you were posting videos of, uh, of Tom playing the drums, like in the middle of your living room right there. And I'm like, how, does he, how the heck do you get that sound, that that killer drum sound, like just recording it in your open living room. But then, you know, when you're playing some stuff for me that, that you're recording, you're working with another band. Um, and I, I told you this in person. I, you know, you have found the, the, the secret or, or success of being able to get a, capture a sound that I haven't heard anybody else in Pittsburgh. Everybody else in Pittsburgh just falls short of being able to capture great uh, drum sounds, good vocals, guitar sounds. You, the drums are slamming when you record them. And, and uh, I, again, I'm, I'm just in awe of how, how it sounds. But um, I mean, how long did you, did you work on trying to perfect that or, or trial and error with things? 13 years. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it takes 12 years to, to just scratch the surface of. Right. I mean, honestly, before we even jumped on here, I'm working on mixes like I've showed yeah. to you mm -hmm. and I'm struggling through them. It's like sound engineering is not something you just jump into one day. And so thank you, by the way, that's a great compliment. Um, I worked very hard on that and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm still learning how to do it. I, I think that I want to hear the thing about music that's that I love about live music is if you sit and listen to a drum kit next to you, it really doesn't sound that great. Most times you just hold your ears because the cymbals are so loud. Right. It's obnoxious. Right. But then you go to a club or you hear a CD and you hear the drum sound on there and you're like, this is what it should sound like. You know, those, right. those tones are in the drums. Right. You've got to find how to pull them out of them and which ones to kind of bring down. And you're, you're kind of making it sound, augmenting it a little bit, making it different. But yeah, I just, um, on that song and the ones I'm working on now, I just make them sound the way that I want to hear a drum sound. I want it to kick you in the gut. You know, I want you to feel that. I want the snare just to like make you go, Ugh, your face, that type right. of thing. So. No, I mean, um, but the, the other part of that is, uh, and I just have, I've, I've recorded in so many studios here in Pittsburgh and it's, they, they, they fall short on the vocals as well. Yeah. Um, now obviously it, it, it takes a great vocalist to be able to lay down and get something raw and it takes the combination of having a really sweet microphone to be able to, you know, to record that. But that's not all it takes to, to, to get that, capture that sound. So what else do you, you guys do to, to make sure you're getting the best vocal sound? Um, you have a singer like Lacey. I mean, I'm, I, I say that, I don't say that jokingly, because honestly, I'll record the exact same microphone that she sings into, the exact same like chain of effects and all these different things. And it just doesn't sound great. Because right. I just have, like, some people just have a great voice to record. And Lacey has one of those voices that when she opens her mouth, it just sounds good. You know, you, you don't hear how someone, they say, oh, you're so photogenic. Every picture I take, you looks good. And other people are like, I cannot get a good picture of myself or whoever it is. Right. I think it's the same way the vocals. And so I don't know that that's so much a critique of Pittsburgh Studios or maybe just a person's voice or something like that. I just, I think that. She makes it easy. When I record her, everything sounds good. Maybe it's the fact that you've been out of the area and she's not from Pittsburgh. People like me go into this. They're like, well, I want to try to get it to sound like him. I'm from Pittsburgh and that's where they screw everything up. <laughs> but it, it, it's true what Mike says. I, I could I could be listening to the radio and it doesn't matter what the band is. If it's I could I could pick out a local recording just like that. I'll be listening to, to the local station, the X, and um, I could... I hear a song start up and I could go to somebody next time. I'm like, this is a local band. They're like, how do you know it's a local band? And at the end of the song, local band, so-and-so. And it's always that same thing. It's that drum sound like they're, you know, in a not on the other side of the building and the, <laughs> and the vocals are just sort of flat and the guitar is usually super um, Thin. Compressed, yeah, compressed and there's no life to it or anything like that. And I've listened to, you know, what you've, had coming out of just your own studio and it doesn't sound anything like, like Pittsburgh. And I think it's just, a, I think a lot of it has to like what you're saying, you have Lacey singing, but 
even with the drum sound and things like that, maybe it's just the fact that you've been out, you've been out of this city for, for a while and you're, and you hear every, I don't know, there's just something different. Cause I've gone, like Mike says, you could go into a studio that's incredibly expensive here. And I, it's always that same thing. You could, you could pick out the local recordings, no matter how much money seems yep. to be spent on. I don't know. And I don't, and I don't get it. No. And uh, another, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to be asking questions that the stuff that I want to know, because our, our, you know, people watch this show that they're probably in the same uh, vein. And I, you know, I'm asking questions that, you know, everybody knows the back story of everything and the, the, the stuff that you can just go on the internet and find the answers for. I, I don't want those answers. I want to, some of the technical juicy stuff. So like, I want to talk about like Lacey, when you're recording vocals, um, the one thing I notice is on, on a lot of songs, even back with Flyleaf and with your, your solo stuff, there's always like these really cool layered vocals. And um, is that something that whenever you're coming up with the, the melody line or you're recording, you already have those parts in mind? Or is it listening back and say, oh, this would sound really cool here. And you just start layering them in. Like, what's the process for, for coming up with those really cool, like layered uh, harmonies and vocal lines and stuff? Well, I think the first time we ever did that was when I was with, <laughs> did our first album with Flyleaf, um, the self-title one with Howard Benson. And he, um, he is all about the vocal. I mean, that is his claim to fame is, I remember the first conversation I had with him uh, to see what it was like. And of course, I didn't really have an opinion. I mean, I didn't really have a say in the end. The record label was the one that was like, this is the guy, you know, but you should talk to him and see what you think. You know, it's kind of like whatever. But when I talked to him, he is, I was like, you know, I want to be able to hear pretty much. I described the way <laughs> Josh mixes. I, was really I, was like, I want to be able to hear if I want to listen to the hi-hat, I want to hear it. You know, if I want to listen to whatever part of the band, I want to be able to hear it. And, and that's what I think is cool about this album, this album. And I was trying to explain that to him and he goes, nobody gives a crap about the hi-hat. Except he didn't say crap. He said something else. Right. Um, <laughs> Started with an F. No, um, no. <laughs> nobody cares about the hi hat, and and I was like, what? <laughs> He's like, if you're on a beach and you're walking past, nobody's gonna be like, hey, look at that hi hat. <laughs> He's like, they're gonna go, who's the singer? Right. <laughs> he literally, like, I don't care about your band. <laughs> I just want to, you know, make your voice sound great. And I was like, well, that's not really how we roll, you know. Right. Flyleaf, you know, we're all equals, and. You know, right. whatever, and and he was like, not to me. No, <laughs> I was geez. like, okay, well, but when I got in the studio, I could see that the time he took on the vocals was really his main thing. Like he pretty much, you know, like he, he was the one that came up with all the layers with all the, you know, not necessarily. And, and some of it was ridiculous. Like, I'm like, there's no way I can sing what you just played on the piano. I'm like, right. he's eh, eh, just try it. I'll fix it. Just eh. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're like, ah. <laughs> and I'm trying to say, all around me. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, there are some like pretty high harmonies and stuff, and you know. He's like, great, great. That's perfect. I'm like, <laughs> do it. Down. So honestly, just to give him credit, all the layers you're talking about really is what it started with him, you know, right. and him deciding. And I'm like, first of all, when he was talking about it, I'm like, I'm never going to do that on stage. Like uh, that. And I was real protective over our live show. He goes, do whatever the, you want, you know, right. <laughs> whatever you want on live but this yeah. is not going to be live. Like make it be a unique experience live. And I'm like, I will. Cause I'm never going to do it. <laughs> and so yeah. the songs never change. Like there, there's a give live. and take on, there's a give and take on that. And I, and I understand it. And as a, as a, you know, musician, producer, and a, and a fan of music, um, I, I, I understand both sides. I like when you're putting it in recording, it's there forever and you want it to be as, perfect as possible and it doesn't matter whether that can be replicated you know so many people think they got to go out and be boston or journey or something like this and replicate that sound live which is really cool if, if you can do that but it's also okay if you're you just say we're a rock band we're just we're just gonna when we get on stage we're just gonna rock it out we're gonna do it the way we're gonna bring you a live experience we're not trying to make it seem like you're listening to the record when we're playing live in front of you so i understand that that it's okay to go do that in the studio because you know, if you have all these different, you know, parts that you're singing, you know, layering in behind you, but you don't have those people on stage doing that, that with you. Um, 
it's, it's fine because when the majority of the time people aren't going to be watching you live, they're going to be listening to the stuff that you have, you know, recorded in the studio. That's so, what Howard's trying to tell us. Right. And all we ever hear to what we're not listening to our album. We're just hearing us live, you know? Right. So our experience is well, we're going to play what we want. And it was never the same. Not with Samir, Pat, Jared. James is probably similar. To right. <laughs> same. Um, I never sing the same. Um, and the thing is, also, we kept the way we wrote some of the songs, even though he changed it. I remember when we got some of those things back. And um, I was like, why did he cut out that whole bridge? Like, that's like half the song. Like, I'm right. like, we're playing that live. <laughs> you know, like, we <laughs> kept it. And so our fans that come to our shows know the difference a lot of times. But, um, you know, those are different fans, too. I, I feel, I, I realize that now that we don't tour it hardly ever, especially in Flyleaf, the fans that love the music recorded is a huge, huge, I mean, it's like, it's, it's just so much, it's, it's just as deep. It's just as real for them, you know, but right. I don't ever meet them. So I don't think about them as much as the ones I see face to face at shows and ones that always come and, you know. Now, how much, how much do you think that you gained um, new fans from your solo stuff? Or do you think that the bulk of those are carryover from Flyleaf? Or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe you have a lot of new new fans that, that are just experiencing you. You know, what's weird is I feel like this is something I feel like God did, you know, um, because I was quit Flyleaf and did not plan to sing ever again on stage. Like I was right. not trying to pursue a music career. Um, but again, you know, when I was, you know, my a little of my story that everybody could you know, find on the internet, um, when I was 16 and... and uh, plan to end my life and had this encounter with God on that day, I knew that not only going from atheist to not believing there's God and it's all random accidents to like, God is real. He created us all and he's intentional. And that was really clear to me. And I was, and it was the, the fear of God was, I had the fear of God. I was terrifying to be an atheist in front of God. Right. <laughs> it's just like, obviously any, you know, created being in front of your creator, if you ever thought about that for any length of time, it kind of blows your mind just thinking about it, but actually experiencing that for me was like, okay, I realized I didn't choose to be bored and that was your idea. And so, okay, what, what am I doing here? And uh, that's kind of the seasons that change in my life. I have my own ideas. And then I always, in the end, I'm like, okay, so what do you think about this idea? <laughs> like, or like, he'll show me, <laughs> you know, like, well, right. that's working out. Um, but with music, particularly after I left Flyleaf, I um, I did not think I would be back out. And the first time I was on a stage again was telling that story I just shared. Um, <clears throat> really felt clear that even though I wasn't going to do music, that I needed to say yes to something that I didn't think I would do, which was tell my story. Franklin Graham asked me to come and tell that story of how <clears throat> I was suicidal. A lot of kids struggle with depression and suicide. And, um, and at that time, I was home with my my son I think I don't figure out how how old was that Joshua it's like a year and a half two years wow. and um he's like we're gonna do five shows we went up the Mississippi River and we want you to come tell your story you know we'll give you 15 minutes 10 15 minutes and um the weirdest thing is like that was a brand new audience to me right and, and uh, I didn't know how to talk. I'm like, what do I do with my hands? Like, can I just have a guitar? Hold on. Half a month. <laughs> my grand- Two months. Right. <laughs> can I sing a song? I'll just sing a little song. So I wrote a song for that purpose. Right. To actually tell my story. So I could, I could talk if I had a song to get me going. Right. <laughs> so, I, so I wrote the reason. The reason, yeah. For that purpose. And then Josh encouraged me to write a book. And then I got more opportunities. And that opened up a bigger audience. And just like mental health audience of like, talking about depression and suicide and, and, um, and that rolled into us doing another album, uh, which probably did pick up new fans, but the most random fans show up at our concerts and they're, they're so broad. I mean, Franklin Graham's audience is broad. Right. Right. You know, it's like the most random people, the whosoever's audience is, so broad as well, like all kinds of music lovers that really just are there for the message because they were helped in some way, um, no matter what genre they like. And um, 
Well, can I, I want to ask you about the whosoever's real quick. Um, and I know that, that a lot of people know about the, that organization. Some people don't, but it's still going pretty strong. But um, how, how did that all get off the, get off the ground? I know that you and Brian had Welsh were, were involved, but um, like what, what was the, the, the nucleus of that idea? And then how did it, it spring out to, to do what it's doing today, which is doing remarkable work? Well, we had done um, Family Values Tour with the with Corn and the Deftones uh, mm-hmm. on uh, when we one of our first big tours, I guess. Actually, it wasn't one of our first big tours. It was like right in the middle when things were going really, really crazy with all around me and stuff. <clears throat> but so I got to know the Deftones guys behind the scenes a little bit, and particularly Chi from the Deftones, um, very spiritual guy. He's a bass player. Mm -hmm. And, um, always wanted to talk to me about, about spiritual things just, and I didn't really take him that seriously because I didn't, wasn't sure if he was sober sometimes. I'm just like, what like, do you really want to talk about this? Like, and Mm -hmm. I felt like he was kind of, and everybody did this to to us, especially me, um, sort of pick on you because of your faith, not just your faith, but just like, see if it's real, (laughs) you know, like, like, Hmm. You know, um, always wanting to, you know, do something that was that sort of tests you, you know, like the singer for corn would always be like, see, he loves you. <laughs> I'm like, oh. it's a liar. <laughs> 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 and he would always say that before he walked on stage. I'm like, Jesus loves you. <laughs> yeah, that's um, um, it's just funny the little things like that, but particularly cheat. Um, and we talk about, um, God and af- the afterlife and, you know, if, if, if there's a spirit, you know, and stuff and Buddhism and why, you know, why you can access the spirit realm when you're in a Buddhist and you meditate and what does that have to do with, and all these questions. And so it's crazy because, um, then he was in a car accident, um, a few years later and I had toured with POD earlier too. One of the most uh, amazing moments meeting Sonny and I was a dork. I was like so dumb. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm Sonny from POD. I was like, I don't know what to say. And I was so <laughs> starstruck. He is he is intimidating because he's so peaceful and so powerful. Like right. peaceful, powerful people, literally like Jesus person, like 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 the lion that loves you. <laughs> and you're like, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's like. He's so kind and so carries such authority, such weight just from his, the respect he has in so many realms, <laughs> rock and just, anyway, um, meeting him was a big deal for me. And, um, and he was like, Oh, that's so cool. You know, I, I'll just tell you one quick story about Sonny. It was that I think is so funny. Um, <laughs> they were all getting tattoos. There's a tattoo guy came out on the tour. <laughs> we were touring with Stained, I think. And, and he said to me one day, he was like, well, are you going to get a tattoo? And I'm like, I'm like, well, I don't, I don't really have money to get one. Actually, I can't afford one right now. He goes, well, listen. And he got real serious. <laughs> like, if you want a tattoo, I'll pay for it. <laughs> and he goes, and this is why, because tattoos, and there was this pause. And I was like, what is he going to say? Like, sage <laughs> moment. He goes, tattoos are cool. <laughs> I was like, nice. Okay. What, what more reason do you need, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's cool. Remember I, that, kids? Yeah. Tattoos are I, cool. I remember my friend got a tattoo on that one. He's like, I want a little one right here. It's like his whole arm it came out. Oh. He's like, I don't know how I got this big. My mom's going to kill me. This uh, is a man who never had one before. Anyway. Um, but so I knew Sunny and I knew Chi, and Chi had. And, and Sonny, uh, P.O.D. and Deftones had toured together before as well. They they knew each other. And um, and so Chi ended up getting in a car accident. He wasn't wearing his seatbelt. He was riding with his sister because he didn't have a seatbelt on the passenger side. He ended up getting thrown, I think, out of the car and ended mm. up in, getting injured and was in a coma. And he was in this coma for a very long time. Um, the entrance ended up running out <clears throat> and Deftones had to continue to tour because they could, they couldn't afford to not tour. And, and so it was a really hard, just sad situation. And so, um, Sonny got together, the singer for POD and started this movement 
uh, pray for chi, one love for chi. <clears throat> and they had talked to Rolling Stone and MTV and they got everybody like, let them know what was going on with chi and see if they could raise money to help pay for some of those medical bills. <clears throat> and they did, and they did, they, they raised a lot of money and they helped, but there was tons and tons of prayer and he came out for a little while. <clears throat> and did pretty well for a little while and we, they were like reading him the bible in there every day and it was like this crazy thing like of people just kind of rallying together over this cause of <clears throat> praying and hope bringing hope to the situation and he got together with his friend ryan reese ryan reese was um so on fire for jesus his faith was brand new he had almost died in a hotel drug over drug overdose like um in <clears throat> where was he amsterdam something like that he had this crazy demonic encounter and mm. almost died and ended up um coming home he was he was a uh he did skate demos for circa footwear and so he would throw these big like parties essentially where he would have these kids who were great skateboarders you know and he would go and do contests and then he would sponsor kids and you know sex drugs rock and roll lifestyle <clears throat> his dad is the pastor of calvary chapel in golden springs california has his own crazy story of alcoholism coming home to kill his family and oh, it's the, the wow. gun the gun uh, hits the tv and the tv turns on and there's two there's like who's that you know there's two You're preachers the there's two <laughs> preachers on tv and they're <laughs> They're spe- they start telling him if your life is a mess. <laughs> so his dad like gets oh, on his knees and gives his life to Jesus in that moment. So this wow. is Ryan's dad. And then Ryan ends up growing up crazy, you know, on this tour or whatever, having this demonic attack. And, then, and he just wrote a book actually. And he just sent me an email with the, the book so I could endorse the book. I'm so excited to do that. Um, so this is my first endorsement. <laughs> yeah. Um, for the whosoever book, Ryan's whosoever book. But um, so he got to, he, he, so Ryan was the one that orchestrated the first event, the first whosoever event with Sonny and Brian Head Welsh, who has a story, his own story about overcoming addiction. Right. And um, we have Sonny, his, his, his um, experience with gangs, his mom passing away of cancer and um, <clears throat> telling his story of his, you know, relationship with God Ryan and, and the hope that he found in that Brian Welsh talking about his experience being free from addiction, Ryan Reese talking about his demonic and freedom and the things that he went through. And then me with struggling with suicide, atheism and depression and all that. <clears throat> and so we put on this event, we tell our stories, which we got together first just to, to raise money and pray for G but then it turned into us just sharing our sharing our stories and asking if anybody else needs prayer and help. And so then it turned into just helping kids that are, that just need help that just are struggling. And so it wasn't even like a fundraiser or anything like that. It was just getting together to pray pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So it's going and he's in high school. He, like, he goes to high schools and he goes to rehabs and he goes to halfway houses and then he goes to like juvie detention centers. And um, these, he does, he's just, so raw and edgy. Right. It's like, even when I first met him, he was brand new. You know, his stories were like, ah, like, <laughs> like I can't get that. <laughs> you know, he's just like so real. No, he's not a church person. <laughs> you know? right. You're like, uh, this is a little rated R uh, here in this church. It's <laughs> <laughs> my rated R testimony. <laughs> yeah. But he's gotten a lot more like seasoned in how he tells things, you know, not, not in a churchy way still, but still, you know, a lot less <laughs> graphic. In some parts. Right. Well, also, um, I know that, uh, you know, you're good friends with, uh, Skillet and, and Corey and, and all of them. Um, and Corey, I think, did she help you write the decree? Yes. You guys, you guys collaborate on that cause you collaborated on, on a couple songs on your, your solo CD as well. <clears throat> um, and then last year, as all going on two years, you were asked to fill in for Jen uh, <laughs> with Skillet on a, on a few yeah. shows. No. And not playing drums, although you probably could do get, get in there and kick some no, butt. They, no. But they they they, they gave that task to Jerb. But yeah. um, they so to take her place for sure. I know. Go, go figure. That's uh, that's a talented girl. But um, so what was that like? Was there any you know? 
part of you that was like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should do this. I don't want to screw up. Or is it just like, yes, this is an opportunity. I'm going to get out there and kick it. Like, what was it like? Well, I, I felt, first of all, like, like their family, you know, right. already. So the relational aspect was simple. <clears throat> and they really trusted me and, and really honored me as a singer who's been doing shows for a while. And their confidence in me really helped my, you know, situation, I think, because, because generally when it's my show, when it's a Lacey show or a Flyley show, I'm not worried about, I just, I'm like, okay, God, you gave me this microphone. So help, you know, do whatever you want. You know, I'm not worried about if it flops. I'm, I'm not, if it flops, it's, it's on him. <laughs> <laughs> But if I'm, if I'm, if it flops and I'm trying to fill in for Jan, it's like, everybody's going to look at me and right. I'll be like, okay. So it, was, it felt a little, you know, a little different in it. You know, ner- I was nervous because it's not natural to sing someone else's songs. You know, if they're your songs and you change it. It's like right. Somebody else's. And, and they are a very different band. They're very different in the way they do things. We're more like sloppy, like, oh, I'm sorry, not. Not Josh is not like that, but <laughs> you guys are more more just rock and roll. Let's get out there and let's just jam and let's just play. Where they've got to be yeah. kind of more precise because of the backing track, you know, the, like the music that they, they have playing there and stuff. Of, and yes, they do a lot of very layered things that are right. so makes the show awesome. Right, it makes the show one of my one of the most. I was like so the first time I saw that show, I was like this show has to cost a zillion dollars <laughs> to do this. It is a and spectacle. It, yeah, it's great. And, and I, to see it behind the scenes is really cool to see how they do it. But you definitely need to know what's going on. And 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 I tend to be just like, I'm in the moment. Like right, I'm, yeah. the girl, I'm thinking about that girl in the third row that's got that green sweater on. And I'm right. like, daydreaming <laughs> about what her life's like. I'm like, uh, sing to her by myself and this i have to think about where's Corey? is she on the riser when's the fire coming off and is this <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you gotta you gotta worry about your uh, uh your your uh stage presence and uh choreography and stuff like that and the outfit she, the, that she picked out like Corey picked out my outfit and everything and i'm like is this gonna be okay is everything in the same place you know it's weird stuff that i never think about because i'm just so like I get lost in our show. Like I'm totally lost. I'm not even like, I can't even literally can't remember the show when I walk off stage. I, I'm lost. Like I had a spiritual experience. I'm worshiping. I'm praying for people. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm literally like thinking about individuals in the show, in the, con- in the, in the crowd, right. constantly the entire show. I'm thinking about the meaning of this song to that woman right there. And I feel like, it's, I feel sort of like a clairvoyant moment. And, and, and it was really cool because I used to have this assistant. She's nice. She really was. I called her my assistant, but she, she, I, I really had her there as a prayer warrior. And I had to give her a title. And she's a great makeup artist, which was a bonus. Right. <laughs> um, but she just came with us from the very beginning when, when we were in our 88 Ford Club Wagon van across, going across the U.S. You know, she got <laughs> a little spot there by the, she's a tiny little lady. And she got her little spot there by the, in the front bench of the van like by the window and uh came out out with us like grown woman like career and everything took her little suitcase and left everything to come on tour with us kids who know if we're gonna right. be successful right. <laughs> she did it. Um, well there I, I i read uh you know majority of the feedback um was was very uh, uh praising of of your work and, and what you did you're always gonna have the the boneheads out there. Oh, she's not Jen or whatever, but majority of people and my, myself included thought you, you nailed it and did a great job. And if anybody else wants to see it, those videos are out there on, on YouTube uh, to watch uh, Lacey singing with Skillet uh, and judge for yourself. I think you did a great job. Link right here. The link right here. <laughs> Other side. Over here. I love the naysayers, by the way. I love, well, as long as they're honest. They're just right. yeah, but I love honest people. They're my favorite. I love it. Well, let's, let's speaking a little bit more uh, of, of Corey and stuff. Are you guys, uh, is there plans to re- uh, collaborate any more on new material or no, right? Not, not right now. Lacey and Corey are like a writing. It's ridiculous how quickly, like they wrote six songs. We've only released the decree. We're about to release the second one it's- and third one. But like they wrote six songs in like what, three days, three or four days. <laughs> it's like, yeah. 
they're a dynamic duo for sure. And so I think it'd be cool. I think it'd be cool to do that, but it's also cool too. We tried like on Life Screams, we did three different mm -hmm. sort of sessions. We did Lacey and Corey session where they wrote together. We did a session with um, a guy named David Hodges. He used to play guitar in Evanescence back in the day. Mm -hmm. He's a producer out in LA, a writer. Um, and then we did stuff where it was just our band here in Pittsburgh in the basement nirvana style in the garage just throw the amps on and just see what comes out so like right. the other two are very calculated right official writing sessions yeah and the other one was just like let's just jam and see what happens i think the only song that came from that that we used was rot i think that was the only one that was actually from like those sessions there but the rest were mainly for that so i like kind of spreading that out a little bit so it doesn't have sort of the same sound you know what i mean throughout the album right yeah it's it's Corey is definitely um I would say she's a genius. I think that is probably the best way. She just, she knows, she hears things in her head constantly. She right. constantly has songs going in her head. She wakes up with songs in her head. <laughs> wakes up and looks like she's going on stage. Like she is. <laughs> I've never seen her off her game ever. Right. And I stayed there and I'm like. <laughs> well, she, she's in the right field. <laughs> I think, yeah, that is that is her thing, and she's excellent. She's just an ex. She's just persistent. well. It's probably also a nice release too to to do something outside of Skillet to collaborate with you because yeah, well, you know. Yeah, the first time that we wrote together, she said something like, something like, "I I like working on music when we're not touring to remind myself that I like it." <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, <laughs> and she's one of the smartest people that I've ever met. She's really deep person she's like we get we have a lot of levels that we connect on and and she's just so honoring and so kind to me like I just I feel like it's too much sometimes I'm like how do you put so much trust in my opinion about that you know because right. I really don't know I'm not really like she's a real musician she knows like all the instruments she knows all the she knows right every every aspect she knows recording she knows everything about like radio and what they can eat and blah, 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 all the things and i'm just like i don't know what i'm doing like i don't i don't know what the note is i don't know how to read nothing i don't know i'm i barely know how to i mean i know like three chords on the guitar like i'm just like i know well a little more than that but i i just think it's cra crazy because she's just so honoring of me and she's so great about it and that's i think that's why we wrote together so quickly she really trusted me and then she's just really great at making songs right and so and i just caught on i mean it's a really easy way to write it's just easy well i mean again you listen to your your solo stuff i don't think you, you i don't think anybody listening to that um is going to come away thinking well they, these guys don't know how to write songs what do they think and I don't, nobody's going to come away thinking that so the, so yeah. it's a great album and um, like I said, I think it's 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 a collaboration of you know multiple facets, but you know not just with with uh, you and Corey. Josh obviously had a you know huge hand obviously in that. Um, the but sound was amazing. Like yeah. I I I like care. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I I am really a, just want to say I when Josh mixed gave and I care about mixes. I'm I'm like I really don't think I care because. I hardly hear ones that I like. That's why. Right. <laughs> but like, I don't, it doesn't ever like stand out to me, but when I hear a mix and I'm like, Oh my gosh, the mix was so good. I could hear everything. I could feel in the right spots. Like it, it, it was the voice. It was like right in your ear. Like it was like exactly like all those things. That's really beautiful about when you catch it. Like, you know, when there's a drummer and you really, he stands out. Because right. there's something special about it. And every other time you don't even think about the drums or like a guitarist. Josh is a kind of guitarist like that too. But he when he mixed the album, I remember when I first heard I didn't mix the album. Wait, oh, I was talking about life. I was talking Evan. About, I was talking about the decree. Oh, you're talking about live streams. I thought you were. Yeah. But I, thought Evan, you were, I thought you were too. <laughs> everything I learned, I learned from Evan, just so you know. So you can Evan, brag Evan, him. Evan is the first one. Evan is one of the, the first ones out, outside of two other producers or mixers. Um that I that I felt that way about two others is it and then Evan and Evan ended up doing live streams, which he's, I love. He's a friend of mine. I had a Pittsburgh local band called Kairos, and our drummer had a brother who lived in Los Angeles named Evan, who was just 
in a band called Cage Nine. Which has amazing albums, by the way. Really good band. He really had a great studio. Sounds. He's always recorded his own stuff. Yeah. And we just said, if we're going to go record, I'd, you know, I showed her Evan's CD. She goes, I want to sound like this. Yes. Right. So we went out there and this is kind of jumping back to our beginning conversation, but like his studio was a room just like mine, a really small studio. His gear was from the nineties. It was not great gear. His microphones <laughs> were busted, but that dude There's knew how to use air it. conditioner right. in the window. I'm like, you want to turn that off? He's like, what's up? Yeah, there's bands playing on both sides of the room, like you know, while we're trying to record vocals, and it's like he he didn't have all the expensive equipment that you've seen in these amazing studios. He had you know a very Heart. <laughs> very modest setup and just crushed it. He knew what to do and knew how to make it sound the way that he wanted to, and so he was yeah, he was definitely a, definitely a great sound. I my you know one of my favorite cuts off that is "Life Screams," the uh, you know just such a powerful song, uh, and and again, it's one of those songs. It's like there, there are certain songs that like whenever like the, the, the chorus kicks in or something or the vocals come in, the background vocals, I don't know what it is. You, you just hear a part of the song and you go, yes, they nailed it. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. And, and that's just one of those songs, like when it kicks in, you're just like, that's exactly what you're supposed to do. And it's all like a little uh, ching, 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 what you do with the guitar there, um, you know, is just like, that's like in the perfect spot. It's like, so don't, you know, folks they don't they're not just going in the studio just jamming okay this stuff is thought out at least that's the way it comes across to people who are listening to it so um it, it sounds very well put together so the, this um the, with with some of this time off and i know i even probably know the answer to this question but i'm going to ask it anyways let me let me preface it another way you have uh three books that basically tell your life you have the reason which is uh, your early life and childhood and, and how you uh, were saved. And that talks about, you know, the formings of Flyleaf and, and with meeting of Josh. And you have the mystery, um, which is about uh, relationships and about how uh, tough relationships are and about how there, there are a lot of uh, work. Um, and uh, then you have the return, which just talks about basically it. I look at all these are like instructional books, you know what I mean? It's instructions on how to live your life by returning the love to God that he has given to you and how to live your life with, you know, everything you do should be showing love towards God. And uh, so with some of this downtime, is there a need for a fourth book? Are you thinking about a fourth book? <laughs> that's the perfect answer <laughs> um, four and five four and five Ellie. yeah I know. Oh. listen we... writing a book it's stressful for josh <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me i'm not writing the book but right. you know like when Lacey had to go through her childhood and all these you know really deep emotional things like she has to work those things out and relive them so she can capture them you know right. like it's a big deal to do that and same thing, you know, her second book where she had to talk about her first marriage and her divorce and all these different things. And, you know, it's a messy situation when you're like going back through the stuff that you came out of, right? you know, to get it informed. And so like, there's two other books and I can't say what they're going to be about, but like, I think it's important. They're, they're going to be books for her, you know, technically our contract with our um, publisher is up. And so I feel like a lot of the things that we wanted to talk about or weren't sure to, we can do whatever we want now because we're not under contract anymore. <laughs> but I think the next two books, the next one in particular is going to be really important. Um, if no one else, just for Lacey. And that's, I think that's how all good art is. If you're making art just for yourself, because it's something you would like, generally other people are going to enjoy that too. You know, yeah, absolutely. We've never, we've never made music or art or anything to please other people, you know? And I think that, um, there's been times where we've had to do that when? with Flyleaf, but oh, not okay. us, right? Well, I doubt that uh, whether you set out to uh, write a book that's going to be inspiring or instructional, um, you know, I think that if, it's, if that's just something that naturally comes out of, out of writing, um, you know, just know that I think that when, when I've, at least the feedback I've gotten from pe other people who have, have read your books and stuff, that's that's what's happening. I mean, people are getting inspired. They're getting, um, you know, basically good instructions. Oh yeah. I never thought about it that way before or whatever. And, um, you know, that's the way I kind of like I, I looked at, uh, at, at the return, um, is, you know, I looked at it as, as a, a, an instructional way to live my life. So it's, it's very help, very helpful. Well, that, 
it, it's interesting you said it that way because originally I wanted to call it the stewardess, um, but then they were worried that it would that people were thinking it was about money. But it's a it is is supposed to be about recognizing life as a gift and how did you use it when you face God? What is he gonna you know like what did you do with like you could face him tomorrow? What did right. you do? I mean, people are dying all around me right now. It's crazy. Like every time I turn around, I'm there's somebody at a funeral or something is going on. And so you're, I'm having to talk to my kids about this almost every day, like um, about, yeah, tomorrow's not guaranteed. If you face God tomorrow, what are you going to say? When you come out of this body, you're going to be in front of your creator. Right. And what do you do with the gift he gave you? And so what I wanted to share and what people ask me all the time, like, how did you become a rock star? How do you do this? Or how do you do that? And really all I do is just try to say that like, okay, God, thank you for a new day. How can I thank you? <laughs> how can I love you back? Just like I said. So that's how everything that has ever touched the beyond me has gone come about. Um, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready to go. (laughs) I'm ready to go, but God's like, it's not time, you know? And I'm like, okay, well, so let's, let's do this adventure, you know? And what is this one? You know, um, but when the time comes, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat you are. I'm like, I'm not in a rush to go, but I'm ready to go. I know because you had your own (laughs) season where you're having to face death and have to like deal with it. Like, well, what if this was it? What'd you do? Did you, did you do what you felt like you're supposed to do today? I mean, what if today's all you got, you know, calm down about everything else, just what's right in front of you, you know? And I think that that's what makes us work together so well. (laughs) And that's, that's kind that's kind of what brought me to you. Cause you know I mean? That's, I, I just have this, you know, I, I'm led by the, by the spirit and I was told, I was told to, to get in touch with you and reach out to you and, and, somehow something would come of it. And I'm like, no, oh, whatever. Okay, God, I'll, if that's what you say, let's do it. So, and that's, that's my whole life. That's pretty much every day. I right. guess. It's very difficult to live with somebody like that. Can I just add that please? Your poor wife, Michael. I know, I know. She says, <laughs> she, yes. you, you, you can have sympathy for her. So, no, so. It's a rich life of adventure and uncertainty. <laughs> right. So anyway, so yeah, we probably should wrap it up. Um, but I really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to do this. I, and again, I, I didn't want to make this a, a, a typical, you know, let's go through Lacey's life and all the stuff that everybody knows and stuff like that. So this is the stuff that's on my mind. And, and uh, if it's on my mind, I'm sure it's on someone else's mind. So, but uh, is there anything you guys want to plug? Uh, anything you've got coming up? Um, actually, you know, a little over a year ago, we met this guy who um, wanted to work on a feature film with us. Hmm. And, uh, Sounds interesting. Very persistent man. Let me tell you about this guy <laughs> named Michael. Sounds like some idiot that I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's a Yinzer from Pittsburgh. That's my buddy. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're. Uh, so you're making a movie, huh? I hmm, can't that's... say too much, but we're finally making a feature film. That, awesome. Uh, it's going to encapsulate Lacey's story. <laughs> Three books um, and one. No, I don't really know. Maybe it's a trilogy. We'll see. We yeah. <laughs> finally Could be a trilogy. Can't mentioned the name yet but we agreed on a director and um excited we've got a great team of people all coming together and so uh yeah that's exciting going into yeah. the new year with you know everything in place so so every anybody that's been you know i know that we've been teasing this for almost two years now or something going on that so be like what, what's going on what's going on these things take time people they really take time trust me we're still working on things it's still coming and things are pro- progressing and moving forward but these things do take times some movies take you know five six years to put together but you know hopefully that won't be this case but you never know but um so how about anyone so you want to, uh, people to keep in touch with you on on uh, social media at all? Would uh, get your your Instagram is uh, official AC Sturm, right? Official AC Sturm Instagram. Most of them are official AC Sturm. Twitter's just AC Sturm. Um, we're doing, and jo- uh, jo- Joshua Levi Sturm for Joshua you. Joshua Levi Sturm. Yeah, you can follow me too. I forgot. Yeah. That. Um, well, hey, you guys you know, are a pair here, so why not? Let me ask you a question. I'm I'm thinking of like hmm. making the studio legit. Um, and yeah. actually starting to take on clients. Um, there's maybe. one right there. There's one right there. there up, we go. Over here. Hey, Mike, you got my wrong name up there <laughs> again. <laughs> it, won't, it won't show. Don't worry. Okay. 
I'm actually um, looking to start. I'm actually doing a, an acoustic single here in early January. But I'm looking to do my an acoustic EP yeah. of like four four songs, sort of have a story. They're all sort of related, and it's just going to be called just me. It's just going to be me and a and an acoustic and an acoustic guitar. Um, you know, I'm a local guy here. Obviously, you could tell from my accent. I'm here. <laughs> originally from Pittsburgh, but I've been doing on even my musician page. And I started, I've been playing for years, but I started out at zero and, you know, 36 followers. I got like 2,700 now, but the last thing I did was just a cell phone and me playing a song about if I, you know, if I met somebody who found out they were dying from cancer, it's got over 19,000 views just from my, yeah. from my cell phone. So I'm looking to roll with that because <laughs> people are actually paying attention to, yeah. versus me, you know, turning on a Marshall and pulling out some of my electrics and doing that. So, I mean, that's really something that I'd like to get started up in, in February. And I've been, you know, I've been talking to some of the people around here and I've actually was contacted by somebody that I'm doing the single ad actually is trying, want me to promote his new studio, but it sort of gets back to the whole sort of thing of, is it really of something that I could, that could be radio play because of the sound quality. Yeah. I have some really nice guitars and Martin D 35. I also have a couple of the triple O's, a 16 to 15 series and add in. I'm just looking, you know, I don't expect it's going to take a million hours, but I'm looking for somewhere, you know, good to go. Maybe even have a good story behind it. Maybe get some people to pay attention and hopefully it'll, hopefully it'll like, it. I think it's actually going to be pretty good. Awesome. Well, is this also a, a call for uh, clients? Do you want people to contact you if they're interested in studio know, time? I, you know, I'll set that up officially when I'm ready to pull the trigger. We'll see. Okay. I'm, I'm mixing my first album because I've done mostly singles up to this point. Now I'm doing a whole album like, oh, they all have to kind of sound similar and it has to be consistent. So. Well, why don't we give them a shout out because we know who the band is. Why don't you give, you give yeah, the band a shout out? Go ahead. So the band's called The Unexpected. Um, Walker Clark is the leader of that band. He's a friend of ours. It's our manager's son. Uh, they actually came on tour with us, did some shows. If you guys saw us on that one tour, the and the music sounds slamming. It sounds great. It's really great. It's yeah. coming from Josh. <laughs> Anything he does, is so good. All right, guys. Well, hey, I hope you and your family have a wonderful Christmas and a and a blessed New Year. Of course, I'll probably see you before the New Year. We know we're going to see each other before yes. the New Year. But uh, anyways, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. We also want to thank our, our other guest, John Elefante. And uh, thank you guys for making this our first uh, year doing the Blabberbrain show. Uh, pretty awesome. And uh, we're looking forward to season two starting next uh, month, somewhere along the line. And uh, so anyways, everybody have a healthy and safe and happy uh, Christmas, New Year's, Kwanzaa, Festivus, uh, Hanukkah. Happy holidays. Just happy combine holidays. it all in one. Yeah. <laughs> happy birthday, Jesus. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll, we'll see you later. Have a good one. Hey guys, thanks. Thanks. thanks.